Hello, I'm the Theorizer. This video is not a joke, okay? I want to make that incredibly clear up front, because people seem to think that at first glance, obviously. In short, Mort from Madagascar has an extremely detailed backstory thanks to the spin-off show All Hail King Julian. I'm not sure what the writers were thinking when they made it, but it's unlike anything I've ever seen. I ended up finding a way to tie it back into the entire history of DreamWorks, and as of this moment I have made 21 videos spread across around 6 hours. I'm not even close to to done either, but the first six parts contain the basics of what Mort actually is, and that's what this compiled video has in it. If you'd prefer the playlist, which does go all the way to part 21, I will link it above now. I'd say enjoy, but... <sighs> Lately, I've been finding a lot of mystery in the most unexpected of places. Scrat is a terraforming alien, Gary is God, the trumpet guy from Shrek 2 is a cult leader, you know the drill. So imagine my surprise when I discover something that's actually up front with its peculiarity. This has been handed to me on a silver platter and I couldn't be more grateful to myself. The Madagascar franchise is composed of four films, a few TV shows, and a litany of shorts. Throughout them all, we bear witness to characters of all sorts, including the most deeply disturbing. Genetically anomalous piece of nefarious, uncanny terror known to cinema. He tries to act cute and cuddly, but he does it maliciously. He knows people see him for what he is, and yet he behaves childlike anyways just to freak them out. His name is Death, for he is Mort the Lemur. I was browsing the Madagascar wiki, as any sane person should do on a regular basis. I couldn't help but notice that there are a number of references in the TV shows that imply him to be wrong in every categorical sense. Thankfully, because of this, I finally have something solid to work with. Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and Mordecai is certainly not, unless he were to reap my consciousness from my body, which he cannot do. I'm immunized to him by nature of the fourth wall. Before we establish all he's done, I need to get the first big theory I have out of the way, that being the timeline of the canon. This is going to get very confusing very quickly because of the nature of the Penguins of Madagascar TV series, the likes of which a timeline placement is dubiously considered amongst even the writers themselves. They claim that people shouldn't care about its placement unless they are top-tier animation geeks with way too much time on their hands. Well, I'm neither. I'm an incredibly dedicated, incredibly serious, fictional theoretician, and I'm paid to do this. Brushing aside minor flashbacks like the intros to Madagascar 2 in the Penguins spin-off movie, or the short films which take place all over. The the timeline essentially looks like this. All Hail King Julian is a prequel followed by Madagascar the First. The Penguins of Madagascar Nickelodeon show is an outlier. Typically the rest of the timeline would go Madagascar the Second, Madagascar the Third, and then the Penguins movie. But the Penguins of Madagascar TV show takes place in the zoo with King Julian and friends there, meaning at least after film one. The question then becomes, does it take place long after everything, including the fourth movie, or does it take place between the Madagascar films somehow, or in a parallel universe variant of where films two or three should be. It's tricky because all could work. If option number one is the truth, then it means the penguins quit their spy jobs, and the lemurs quit the circus, and in the far, far future they all exist back in the zoo. If it's somehow between films two and three or one and two, then it would mean the penguins and lemurs shunned the zoo gang and temporarily returned without them. The final choice is that they left permanently and stranded them either on Madagascar or mainland Africa, depending on when is more likely. The creators seem mixed on which of these is the truth, but for now, we focus on the characters. These three options, however, will come in handy later. It's most likely after everything, or a parallel reality, though. Now that we've theorized on the possible placements of the Penguin's spin-off, we move on to the questions surrounding Mort. It is overwhelming, I assure you. First of all, Mort? <laughs> He's not a child. He may look like a child. He may act like a child, he may sound like a child, but he is at minimum 35 to 50 years old. This is no joke. All Hail King Julian is weird. In fact, so weird that the crazy is just beginning. Mort is a Microcebus Lahilahitsura on the outside, but the inside proves him to be far, far more sinister. He 
is a pot-belly pig. But that's not all. He's also part bear, part starfish, and no joke, part spider. He also has trace elements in his genome of sand, cacti, copper, and sawdust. And it doesn't end there. He has a disturbing marriage history. He has not one, not two, but 11 ex-wives, and all of them are dead. He is also invulnerable and has superior strength due to his delusional and obsessed nature surrounding King Julian's feet. He's a yes-man that eats glue, and he's such a quizzical little rat. Finally, it's revealed that whatever he is, is immortal, and has the terrifying ability to suck the souls out of similar species, absorbing them into his mind and creating a split personality. Again, a lot to work with. With that said, clearly this will take some time. I recently stretched five seconds of trumpet playing during Shrek 2 into a 10 minute depth analysis. This time we have something solid. There is more mort, there will be more content. This is going to be more of a documentary than a theory, be warned. There's more discussion and analysis here than hypothesis. I am aware that I will have to watch every single episode of Penguins of Madagascar and then every single episode of All Hail King Julian. I foresee that this endeavor could span at least a couple of years, which means I'd need to update you along the way. Thus, solving Mort will likely take a grand total of 15 videos, adding up to 4 hours. If I can condense it properly, of course. Based on my current upload schedule, every third video I post until spring 2022 will be a Mort analysis. The question is, should I do this? I need an empty 230 square foot room to organize my thoughts because a single notepad clearly won't cut it and I'll need to invest in 8 cork boards and around 250 meters of twine. The immediate true mystery is, what can I do with this now? From what I understand, there have been a couple of videos discussing Mort and a couple of Reddit posts. I refuse to watch or read them for fear of a skewed conclusion, and I don't know how serious or non-serious those discussions are to begin with. With that said, I can organize a battle plan for this miraculous hit piece. This is part one, which means part two and three will also share the theme of highlighting evidence, with many theories along the way. I will spend the rest of this video looking at Mort's oddities within the Madagascar movies, and then spend video number two looking at him in Penguins, finally topping up the first trilogy with video 3, his strangeness in the prequel series. The second trilogy, videos 4, 5, and 6, would then need to begin cross-connecting the clues and formulating more major theories from the smaller ones. I'll probably spend one video on his Julian obsession, one video on his wives, and one video on his soul-sucking immortal and impossible genome. Videos 7, 8, and 9 I have a more strict plan for. They are going to be composed of past theories I am integrating in. 10, 11, and 12 I am going to connect them. I'll spend one video connecting Mort's mysteries to Over the Hedge, one connecting them to my Dubois analysis and one connecting them to a final mystery film or straight up creating a grand unifying DreamWorks theory from what I've found. Which leaves us with 13, 14, and 15. I'm still debating whether or not I'll actually need the extra hour or extra three videos, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. There's also the matter of how this will perform in the YouTube algorithm. Now that you're all prepared for what's to come, we begin with the evidence you'll all be familiar with. Mort in the Madagascar films. In the first movie, we meet him. Mort is a small lemur obsessed with King Julian, and is sort of the opposite of King Julian's actual second-in-command, Maurice. Mort is used as a test to see how the New York animals will react to lemurs, and is generally hated by his peers. He plays a perfectly fine but intentionally annoying role in film one. In the sequel, he clings to the plane and behaves oddly. He first parodies the Twilight Zone and then goes flying thousands of feet into the Mozambique Channel. He stubbornly survives and then is chased by a shark all the way to Central Africa where he ascends a volcano and nearly falls in. The third film follows him joining the gang in the circus where he, again, plays a lesser role, but he does end up shooting Dubois with a tranquilizer gun. He's dumb at times, rational at others, and sort of all over the map. This is what makes him questionable. Primarily, what the films are good for is proving one thing. Mort is not mortal. Our dear friend, the French Death is indestructible. He looks malicious at first on the wing of the plane because it's probably one of his alternate personalities, more on that later. He rips it apart and causes the engines to fail, crashing the plane soon after. When he presumably flips back to the dumb old Mort persona, he falls off, sails thousands of feet into the Indian Ocean, and doesn't die. He is pursued by a juvenile great white shark and evades it, though it desperately chases him on land as well. Mort doesn't die, which is the first crucial chunk to the theory that from this point can only evolve. With that said, it can only get more insane from here, so should I? He's such an enigma that while writing this I was convulsing like a deranged artichoke. 
Speaking of the Soviet Union, it won't be long before I integrate Nana into this dissertation. Again, it'll probably be in the latter half of this journey, but everyone make sure you're caught up with my other DreamWorks theories, just in case. For now, though, subscribe so I know to make more of this, and comment Mort's odd moments from the shows and give me a little head start. Uploads may be scarce or a tiny bit here. My confused immune system has been attacking me for two and a half years now, but it's gotten really agitated in the past month and it's made me too anemic and unfocused to think to my fullest, but when I get my hemoglobin out of its seven gram per deciliter hole, I assure you, I will start critically thinking a bit better. <gasps> and we'll be able to fully expose Mort as the war criminal he is. This was an establishment video laying it all out on the table, solving the timeline and looking at his film appearances. It only goes up from here. Until my next video in the coming weeks, I am the Theorizer. Oh yes, I'm really doing this. Everyone viewing this, welcome to part two. What you are watching right now is the second part to what could possibly end up being a 15 part series, and I will link part one in the little card above now. It's only 10 minutes long, and it's a decent establishment video that attempts to organize what is to come. It's a prologue, and it truly highlights some of the things that Mort has done. In the Madagascar franchise, that is. Some people thought I was making outlandish claims about him in that video and not backing it up. I want to again inform you, those were not my claims. Those were literally things Mort is in the spin-off show. He does have like 12 wives. He is a soul sucker. He is genetically anomalous. I also do have some more news, though. The mystery series I will be incorporating into this, alongside my Dubois and Over the Hedge theories, might be my eight-part series on the lore of Shrek. That means the timeline theory, four godmother theories, two donkey theories, and the recent Reggie video will all be a part of this huge DreamWorks dissertation. We'll see how big this video, part two, ends up being as well, and then we'll regroup. Before we begin, I also have updated news on the Madagascar timeline. From what I understand, Penguins of Madagascar, the TV show, does come after everything in the timeline because at the end of their movie, they meet up with the circus gang again in a post-credits scene I had missed. We see Julian and friends in a Madagascar crate during the Penguins TV intro sequence, but it's likely a scheme of some sort after breaking up with Sonya. So with that said, incorporating the shorts and once again excluding the intro scenes of Madagascar 2 and Penguins, our official timeline stands as All Hail King Julian, The Christmas Cake Paper, Madagascar the First, Mary Madagascar, Madagascar the Second, Madly Madagascar, Madagascar the Third, The Penguins Movie, and yes, finally, The Penguins TV Show. We've finally put a definitive and necessary close on the timeline. There seems to be an upcoming Hulu prequel show detailing the zoo gang as children, and that would be before everything, but it's irrelevant to Mort, and it's not even here yet. So now, people, do you know what time it is? I promised part two would be me detailing Mort's oddness in The Penguins TV Show, but I just had to watch All Hail King Julian. I had to. And I watched all six seasons of it. It consumed the month of May. It's why I got no uploads out. So we'll do that first and highlight every bit of oddness in this video. Warning of a lifetime. I might need more than just one. Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and you can tell it's weird when this show is stranger than all of my other theories combined. It's made by different people, but it's canon still, so this will get interesting. It's basically like these writers are literally tempting conspiracy theorists. They load in as many offhand weird comments as possible and literally bait you into solving them. Silver platter granted to me, I swear to you. It's painfully self-aware. What they've done is crazy. Mort is like if my Patrick Star theories all came true. I'm not joking. He truly is a multi-dimensional identity absorber. This is quickly going to devolve into a rapid bullet point format of insanity. Any qualms I had about him just being delusional this whole time were obliterated with this show from the first moments when he tempts the Fusa with a high-key, um dance 
What this episode does try to explain is the feat. Julian rushes in and kicks the predators away with his dance, and Mort develops an obsession with his savior, King Julian, and the weapon of his salvation, his, um, feet. It might not be the true root of this obsession, though. We'll see later if it's a red herring or not. Here, Mort has suspicious intentions, and seems smart enough to evade death, and has love for Julian. We already know all of this. The show is full of that fast-paced, lazy joke slapstick, and yet, it's also wildly inappropriate and amusing at totally random moments. This will also be a review of the show in some ways. In episode 2, he continues with the inappropriate references, and in episode 3, he authors a best-selling coloring book called Fifty Shades of King Julian. When asked to keep a secret, he claims that he has voices that tell him to hide things until it's too late for people to stop him. In this episode, he also survives being eaten by a carnivorous flower and projectile vomiting way more than his body allows for. He is also blown up, crushed, carried away by a bird, and slammed into the ground from hundreds of feet. And again, the humor, it's so adult. There is no way kids wouldn't pick up on this, it's so constant. In the following episode, people literally get drunk from partying, and in episode 5, the Fusa engage in a proclaimed mating ritual to create a new species. It's absolutely crazy. There's this evil Fanaloka named Carl, who has an intimate relationship with his purring pet cockroach. The show is self-aware, and Mord is always this show's test subject. The characters seem to already know he's indestructible, and they send him into dangerous situations constantly. Mort thinks Julian has exploded near the end of episode 3, and proclaims that no matter how much Julian rots, he will put him back together, and they'll live with each other forever and ever. A whole new level of disturbed. Packed with lore as ever, the end of the episode seems to reveal that there are certain gods in the sky who respect the denizens of Madagascar. This is our first true taste of the supernatural in this show, and it might come in handy down the road. Still, we're only a few episodes in. This is going to drain me in the best way possible. But back to episode 4, Mort is behaving and speaking a little more intensely while doing a security check on someone. He wears a glove on his head, and it transforms him. From what I've read on the wiki, I'm fairly certain I know what this is, but I'll delve more into that later, because if I theorize now, it'll just be answered later and the time will be wasted. Basically though, Mort spontaneously changes personality, accent, appearance, and still notices that the feet look different today. In the fifth episode, he claims the feet haunt his dreams with pleasure. Mort seems to be lucid no matter how dumb he behaves. He has slightly violent tendencies too, I've noticed, to go along with his indestructibility. He says crazy things while self-aware, proclaiming Julian and Maurice's argument as a mommy and daddy fight. But pause on Mort for a second and let's go back to those sky gods the lemurs worship. When episode 7 begins, they play a boombox and clouds roll in, seemingly confirming the existence of those deities, but I have to theorize a little bit here, bear with me. Because one episode prior, King Julian's bodyguard, Clover, goes on a vacation and she meets a very strange spiritual guru inner peace guy named Sage, who, when he heads off, whistles and a massive bird carries him away into the sky. Could this little bit of oddness be tied to the sky gods? We'll need to see if this sort of thing ever shows up again, because Sage's supernatural aura could tie to these sky gods and Mort can tie to them thereby possibly answering some things. Because Mort and these deities are the two main supernatural elements of this show from what I've seen so far. You know, aside from this lizard oracle, this show is chaotic neutral. Julian tries to fix his boombox so as to reconnect with Kevin, the god of precipitation, with the help of a small Teneric named Timo, who claims Julian's family is inbred. Inappropriate kids show, but there's your single explanation for Julian's behavior. Inbreeding. Timo fixes the boombox with mechanical skills and becomes their scientist. He works out of a crashed USSR space pod. While he fixes the boombox to reconnect with the sky gods, Mort tries to summon rain with a song of his own and flings sticks into the sky. He suddenly screams, SUN! And then the sticks return, stab him perfectly with maximum force. It's possible that he's an enemy of the sky gods and may not even know it. When they bring back the boombox to summon Kevin, Mort screams that the boombox is undead like a zombie and panics. You have experience with that too, Mort? In a previous episode, we saw Mort's x-ray, but here, a blow dryer seems to go through his mouth and out his butt real quick, so which is it? Normal anatomy or anomalous? 
When he invites the local oracle into his home, he has a very odd demeanor and offers her a lotion made of his own tears. In this episode, episode 7, everyone sort of talks to themselves and acts if they have voices and identities, but Mort, as usual, takes the cake when he gets in the bathtub with the oracle and claims they'll be sisters forever. They borderline portray him as Annie from Misery, as creepy as maximally self-aware as possible. They play the creepiest music as Mort disappears and then reappears with a blonde wig on and treats her like they are sisters. Something's going on here. Something tells me this is a soul the wiki had referred to, one he absorbed. I'm getting ahead of myself. Next episode, Mort bullies Maurice and then joins a monarchy rebellion group who manipulates him into creating good art to convince others of rebelling. Based off of the things he's drawing, I'm quite sure he knows he's being manipulated. He flips back and forth, eats dog meat and vomits it up. He knocks a ton of cacti over on them. He knows he's irritating them. In episode 9, he's scared, then bold, then claims he saves cake for his cheat days, and then things finally hit their stride and unravel in the season 1 finale. We're going through this quick and I'm taking notes real quick. First, Maurice claims that he's just a co-star, implying he knows he's on a TV show. Then, Mort hits back with the innuendos, saying he'd love to eat the yummy King Julian. But the finale's true purpose is what shocks me most of all, and answers many of the oddities so far. You see, there's this cove of wonders near their kingdom, where tons of stuff washes ashore and they find coffee. Julian gives it to the kingdom to improve productivity, and Mort tries chewing the coffee because he's stupid and he screeches about how he has a drinking problem. <laughs> the kingdom starts losing it, and and then, literally right after this show jokes about conspiracies of super intelligent Middle Earth government corruption, the most actually unexpected left field answer to all of this madness emerges from the shadows. Mort walks in with a monocle on and a British accent claiming coffee has had a drastic effect on him, making him extremely intelligent for as long as it's in his system. I believe Mort being this small and having that much coffee has had this crazy hypermetabolic effect that cranked him way past being hyper and basically acted as a drug unlocking his brain. I can't tell if this is just a more intelligent Mort or a new personality altogether, but smart Mort does claim he loves King Julian just as regular Mort does. It's soon revealed that the evil Carl guy set up the coffee to take over the kingdom with caffeine addiction. Smart Mort helps save the day, claiming normal Mort is barely competent. He convinces all of Carl's guards that they should be unsatisfied with their current healthcare plan and that he can help them form a union to negotiate a working wage and a retirement plan. I am not joking. This is like the culmination of every whack theory I've ever posted on this channel, and I'm made for this. Carl's workers turn on him and Mort slowly degrades back and forth before becoming obsessed over the feet once again. The day is saved and season one finishes, but the show is not nearly over, and my theories are truly, truly just now beginning. In season two, Mort keeps being crazy and playing along with jokes, including when he spontaneously summons an organ out of thin air and says he won't explain how he did it. The second episode is one massive social commentary after another, and the third showcases Mort's creepiness when his voice deepens. It's so romantically disturbed. He brings out the blonde wig again and then tries to make a self-aware joke by saying, Denial isn't just a river I heard about, apparently. He claims he's been in strange love before. Or is this a separate wig persona? We meet Clover's sister, Crimson, and she almost gets married to Julian, who objects and claims he's having an affair by loving his kingdom more than her, causing her to dip out and team up with Julian's uncle, who is trying to reclaim the throne. More later on that. But the reason for Mort's wig here? He's the flower girl of the wedding. He behaves differently, I swear. It's not the Mort we're used to. By episode 4, things start to get weird again when King Julian is given a pineapple and tricked into believing it contains the knowledge of all kings prior after he rips apart the beach ball of baby lemurs and tells them to go home and atrophy like normal children. What? Mort gets jealous of the pineapple's closeness to Julian and dreams of mutilating it. His worries aren't baseless as Julian claims to spoon the pineapple at night. Mort kidnaps the pineapple and ties it to a chair while putting on a villainous accent and stroking his tail like a villain would stroke its cat. This is almost certainly another 
persona. So now we've got Smart Mort, the Misery Mort, this Mort, I'll catalog it later. They all seem to share the same motivations, like Mort has influenced them, but at their core they are not our Mort. Mort hallucinates that the pineapple is sentient and mocking him. When approached about his kidnapping of the pineapple, his inner monologue panics and then suddenly his face changes, and another Mort responds to the inner monologue followed by another, and another, and then one of them says, I thought we were alone in here! They are now quite distinctly escalating the voices in his head from joke status to mystery status. To escape the confrontation, Mort spontaneously vomits excessively before regretting the sadness he's brought to Julian by kidnapping the pineapple. He tries returning it and evades some Fusa by tempting them with his little dance again. The Sky Gods perform a deus ex machina and strike down the Fusa with lightning, but Julian seemingly dies in the ensuing madness and appears in limbo where the pineapple some friggin' how proves itself to actually be sentient, unless this is just his subconscious. Just before he reawakens, Mort claims, He looks so peaceful! I can have his body, right? He says it in the creepiest possible alternate accent. Who is this now? Is it really Mort? Regardless of the pineapple sapiens, the episode ends when Mort crushes it with a sledgehammer. Next episode, he makes an intentionally creepy drawing of Julian and to top it off, helps introduce money into the kingdom. <laughs> he immediately becomes a loan shark who cons people within seconds. I'm not sure if his cleverness is him or another persona. He manipulates the entire population of the kingdom and creates devil deal contracts in which people sell him their souls or their babies. Again, this isn't my interpretation. This is all word for word in the show. He then promises Julian money if he sells his body to him by having Mort go on a date with his foot. What the f Everyone starts dying off because he hoards the money as a tycoon, culminating when Mort says, game over, and reveals he thought he was playing Monopoly the whole time. Next episode, Sage comes back and we see the huge hawk again, who he claims is his spirit animal. Other than that, there is still no evidence Sage has relations with the Sky Gods. In the seventh episode of season two, Mort claims he's always off in his own world before his eyes split apart. This is in an episode amongst rigorous political innuendo regarding Julian's ancestor, Julian the Terrible, who is later struck with lightning, presumably by the gods, before disintegrating. <laughs> Crazy show. Episode 8, though, is top-tier disturbed when Mort is so desperate for Julian's love that he convinces him he's secretly been his son all along. Mort then pretends to be a baby, and embraces it to the point that I think it might be yet another personality. It's uncanny and bizarre. When Julian asks Clover to be the mommy, she picks up Mort and his accent changes again when he calls her hard and bony. You guys were right. This show takes years off your life. I feel my soul just leeching away. This episode ends up doing crazy stuff, including a pageant Karen named Tammy, who hypnotized her infant son, but the moral of this episode is this. Mort is actually older than King Julian is. We knew this before, but I want more explanation of this, and I just know I'll be getting some eventually. This show overall feels like one of those episodic comedies, but the writers have an absolutely phenomenal respect for continuity better than some dramas I've seen. This makes it easier and deliberate. Commendable. But then in episode 9, Mort inhales Julian's aged toenail clippings to track him like a bloodhound. Fuck. You know what's funny? Many times now I've made a joke when writing notes here, and then seconds later it happens in the episode. Just goes to show how off the wall this really is. It is as crazy as my craziest theories. Mort attacks the guy who kidnapped Julian in this episode and literally tears apart his face until he looks thrice his initial age. I, I just, I just, I don't, it can't even. In episode 10, Julian reaches down Mort's esophagus and pulls out a live butterfly and a skeletonized human arm. In the following episode, Mort is his usual chaotic self, but we also see a monkey from the USSR who crashed on Madagascar from outer space, and he's still alive. He then returns home, where the USSR flags are still in full effect, meaning Madagascar might take place in the 80s. I need more before solidifying it, though. In episode 12, Mort tries out to be Julian's rebound advisor after Maurice leaves. 
Mort pretends to be French, then sophisticated, and then really suggestive. He licks his finger and sizzles it on his buttock. Are these more personas? Well, the snazzy one wears the same wig as the misery altar, so maybe? It's hard to tell as he admits he's faking it. In Julian's time of need, the pineapple's ghost reappears to him. Still unclear whether it's an advisor from the heavens, Julian's conscience, or something to do with the sky gods. I, I, I don't know. In episode 13, Mort once again pulls the mommy-daddy card on the main characters. Weird perspective. Episode 14 is relentlessly rife with religious commentary when the existence of the sky gods is finally questioned. Suddenly, one of the gods appears, but it's just a robotic ploy by Carl to kill Julian. So they build a counter robot and Mort attacks back. Will we ever learn the truth of the supernatural? This show's having an identity crisis and it thinks it is the leftovers. But near the end, a massive cloud does fly down and immediately back up after raining and electrocuting, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that these gods do exist. In episode 15, Mort becomes the face of Julian's new nightclub, Club Moist. He dances up on stage like a chick from the Roaring Twenties, singing about how Julian's feet make him weak, and everyone applauds Mort for being so moist. They rename him to Pork because he's tender, sweet, and smoky. He celebrates by raving about how he's a non-kosher meat. He attracts lemurs from all over the kingdom when he sings about bunions. This is another personality I dare you to pull it up on Netflix and watch for yourself. Mort wishes to be used words from his own mouth. In the season 2 finale, Julian thinks he's dying, so Mort keeps giving him sponge baths and rectal thermometers. Onward to season 3, but be warned, everybody, this is when things start to actually get weird. What you've seen so far is literally nothing. Inappropriate messages abound about selling bodies, holes, and bloomers. The two-part premiere follows everyone saving Julian again, who's been kidnapped by pirates this time. Mort, as per the usual, tracks with conviction so intense he eats Julian's footprints. He organizes a battle plan as if he's some sort of warlord, maybe another persona. When they find the ship, all of the other pirates recognize Mort as Dread Pirate Mort, the nemesis of this ship's captain. Last they met, they were fighting for the love of Empress Galeria off the jagged coast of Fush. He has a painting of the battle on his wall at home, and he screams, For Galeria, before owning the other captain. Mort calls the other pirates mere children and doesn't object to the notion that he'd kill at least five people a day during his pirating years. Then, he shows off his true supernatural capabilities when Clover dangles Julian like a carrot on a stick above Mort, causing him to sprint on the water and drag their boat behind him. When Julian's parents return, Julian is thrilled, but the others are not, and Mort suggests they eliminate the parents and make it look like an accident. Apparently, he knows a guy. Everyone finally just asks Mort, what the hell is wrong with him? And he says a lot of stuff before splitting his eyeballs again. When they decide to focus on older hobbies, Mort claims his favorite hobby is making wigs out of stolen hair. Fucking fuck McFuck. Maurice's only hobby is taking care of Julian, who's the closest family he has. Mort interrupts and proclaims that he's outlived all of his relatives. It's like he's flaunting his eeriness at this point. He suddenly forgets Clover even exists for a moment, and then we see into Julian's nightmare. And the second it popped up, I knew what they were doing. I just about died from throwing my body into the wall, aghast with shattered expectations. Nope. <laughs> no, 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 nope. Say that it's me! Uh, oh, you gotta be fing kidding me. What? You know, this actually makes about as much contextual sense as the work it's based on. So this is directly parodying Twin Peaks, and just when I thought they wouldn't go there, they did exactly that. By the way, I did reverse Mort's speech, and he basically just says here, Let's do this! From where we come from, there's always mangoes in the air. Reference to something that itself makes sense to the subconscious of maybe a sleep paralysis demon. From what we've seen, I must admit, 
Mort is the best one for this portrayal. A pineapple even flies by, once again pulling a leftovers by hiding whether or not this fruit spirit is just in his dreams or if it's really a spiritual mystery box. Mort later obsesses over Julian having dreamt of him and calls him a lover. Julian hallucinates Mort getting eaten by a shark and Mort somehow is aware of this. Can he read minds? Mort helps make Maurice cry just to mock his emotions. Mort brings up that guy who makes people disappear, again, on deaf ears. At this point we've reached episode 5 of the third season and Mort's back at it with that glove that makes him aggressive. He sniffs it and laughs evilly, presumably knowing that it will summon his altar like last time. We are met with more and more fourth wall breaks than ever, and Mort severely dislocates his rib and cranks it back into place maniacally. By the way, it's revealed that there's an uprising of sentient bells that plan to reclaim Madagascar from beneath the ground. Apparently Mort does have experience with zombies, as we jokingly asked before, because in episode 6 he has a tea party with one. In episode 7, Mort romanticizes Julian again and then gets abducted by aliens after praying to the sky gods. Psychic lizard lady uses her telepathy and sees it was just some researchers tracking lemurs. They barcoded Mort. This proves that the lizard truly is magic though, and she can read minds quite clearly, so there is some supernatural in the show. Mort sifts through every personality type we've seen yet while going through this episode. Maybe they were out researching him for his anomalous psychology? They do chip him the following night, and everyone rescues him later, learning that humans exist in the process. So yes, this episode is crucial, but I question why they wear hazmat suits in Madagascar. Mort then eats a bucket of tracking chips, of course. Everyone else hides in the bunker, and when the main characters get back and they cannot find anyone, they think all of the kingdom raptured to the sky god's heavens. The psychic lizard laments about being left behind. This show thinks it's the leftovers again. <laughs> In episode 8, Mort pretends to be a butterfly so he can start a war by firing mangoes at innocents from the air. Turns out the real butterflies are all psychopaths and were just waiting for a reason to attack, so now they have it. War happens, socio-political commentary, they kill the queen, happy ending, and then finally, finally, we get the next true reveal episode. Sort of. Julian wants fast food for the kingdom. Mort helps out. He claims he was born five years premature. His grandmother left him a huge tank of healthy food. He puts on a deep voice that sounds nothing like himself. Actual anti-falsetto headass. It gets crazier. Way crazier. They run out of food and Julian asks Mort to remember how they can get some more. Mort panics and screams he forgets everything his granny told him because it was 50 years ago. Julian screams, how old are you? And then Mort's inner voice, himself, says, Come on, Mordecai, you can remember. Before he suddenly sees his granny. She is the one with the blonde wig, from what I can best tell. He's pulling some sort of Bates Motel altar. He communes with her memory somehow. Julian slaps him and asks who he's talking to. Mort intuits the recipe for fast food and loads a bunch of discarded junk into the food tank and creates food again, but then it becomes a huge metallic black hole of sorts that sucks everyone in until Clover saves them. So we know Mort's granny has some answers to the madness. I need to see more of her or smart Mort to get some true theories going here. Mort wants to eat a scorpion, but his mouth won't open wide enough. He slurps it up anyways. The scorpions crawl out and he consumes them again. It's now episode 10, more political commentary. This one is really trying hard to make itself obvious. Not particularly one way or another, but the show undoes its own lessons and just mocks literally every aspect of various situations through a lens of lemurs. The jokes also have reached the point of being as edgy as Total Drama Island, but slightly more veiled. In episode 11, Mort claims he had a homeschool prom with his granny. Cue to him making out with her in his mind. He wakes up and screams, what year is this? With a wig on. He references his grandmother again in episode 12, when he quotes her as saying, Set the butterfly free, and if it gets caught in the spider web, there's gonna be a whole bunch of spider babies come springtime. <laughs> he then flips upside down with a horrific grin on his face, and crawls around the room cackling like an evil spider. He's beaten to near death by a huge wildebeest and is fine. He explains this, claiming he's part starfish, and that he can regenerate so well once he grew back his own head. They literally just explained part of his seeming invulnerability. They did it for me. This is, once again, like if my Patrick Star theories came to life. If he's a starfish, then he almost certainly is also part spider based on what we just saw earlier there. He doesn't lie. He's serious. 
Everything is appallingly true. He gets the snazzy voice on again when he says, I'll do what you want. You don't have to poke me with a stick. Unless you want to. Her, her, her. He gets sucked into a reel of tape, compressing him into the cassette, but he's a starfish, so that's fine. He's fine, obviously. Clover gets hurt, and she appears in the White Void, where Pineapple greets her and brings her one of her deceased relatives. Clover knows Kung Fu like the panda variety, and her grandmother taught her before dying. This then clearly is Limbo, it's not all in Julian's mind, as Clover never met Pineapple. The Pineapple is just the random form the King's spirits decided to take after people joked about it really being the case. It truly is supernatural. This has ramifications. Pineapple claims he made an interdimensional bet, and he fears he will lose it. We later confirm for good that this is the afterlife, and a bunch of fruits rule over it as they watch a cage fight between Clover's grandma and the man who killed her. This just leveled up. I'm sort of blowing all my theories now, but I really damn think these fruits are the sky gods. Or, at least what Julian has interpreted as sky gods. They call heaven Frank Rilla, and this is later revealed to be Frank Rilla, and the Frank Rilla is the sky gods heaven, etc. Interpretation. Finally, in the season 3 finale, Julian wants to map all of the universe, and Mort claims he's from a planet named Futicus Majora in the far reaches of space. He could be pretending, not lying, but pretending. This is, after all, just a pretend map, and Julian says get your own solar system. But what if he's not kidding? This explains everything and nothing at the same time. Alien Mort. In this finale, everyone builds a wall to keep out the other species. Hmm. They launch all of the Madagascar kingdoms out with a catapult, and then the various other kings all rally under a mysterious overseer that plans a revolution revealed to be none other than Mort. Julian, in his direst time of need, sees the ghost of Pineapple, who's in rough shape because he lost his bets and he owes everyone money. Julian dismisses his advice as greeting card sentiment and walks away. Mort doesn't like leading a revolution, but I'm pretty sure another personality stepped into the job because he rallies all the kings to invade and proclaims how everyone has to go for the males first, sell the children, and quote, the women. <laughs> oh, the women. <laughs> we always treat with respect. <laughs> you never know what's him or his alter egos, and this is putting me in a tight situation. I need to cut it here because this is quite possibly the longest individual theory video I have ever posted. It might break my 25 minute limit and I need probably two more. Yes, this is still all only part two, and now it's been split into three sections so I can edit it all in time. I'm going to edit the next one now really quick and get it out ASAP, so absolutely subscribe and stay tuned because season four is easily when things become Mort's show. All of our questions are seemingly answered, and finally, my theories can begin to flourish. Until next time, I'm the Theorizer. Everyone, make sure to watch the prologue to this huge theory first, and then the big first section of evidence. You are basically on part three right now. Technically, it's part two, section two, but for the sake of the algorithm, I'm going to call it part three. I will link parts one and two above now as a playlist that I've made. For those who are prepared, it's time for season four of All Hail King Julian. We are halfway through the show. Mort starts off the premiere by getting his own TV show called Still Life with Feet, where he mimics Bob Ross and draws Julian's feet. He also, of course, wears the blonde wig again and actually shows us another wig he's woven out of the stolen hair he mentioned from before. Clearly, this is something all of the personalities enjoy doing. More people mock Maurice until he runs away bawling, I have feelings! Mort fears that Julian can somehow hear his thoughts and he panics, worried they will betray him. We're getting close to some answers, I, I can just feel it. A couple of characters rob the kingdom, and during it, they have an odd conversation about friendly, non-weird wrestling. When they're arrested, they get put in a prison cell where Mort also resides, and he says the crazy line, Orange is the new you. Wanna wrestle? As long as it's weird. Creepy as hell. Another 
persona. You see, this show is crazier than even the worst SpongeBob, and yet it has incredible consistency. I've said it before. This makes it truly disturbed. It's a show that pretends to be a kid's show, and that's what makes it so eerie. But it actually is a kid's show, so it's very unsettling. Mort finally describes his inner imagination world in episode 2 when he says nobody ever gets hurt there. Most of the time. I want to see this world, Mort. Later, everyone puts on a massive act and he plays the bad guy. He relishes in this and darkly chuckles with glee. Another persona? He gets a little too into it and lowers them all into a volcano while laughing like a maniac. Later, it is implied that he is faking it, though. In episode 3, he once again shows his artistic ability when he paints a phenomenal image of Julian. And Julian, of course, calls him a vulgar little mutant. Mort asks, When's lunch? I haven't eaten in like a month. Ah, a self-sustaining system, perpetuating the Lovecraftian take yet further. He claims he's real good at smearing stuff, and that he has parties with organic mannequins of his friends. What Mort has is an obsession with Julian. It sure ain't love, and I don't know if I'd necessarily call it fetishization either. It's an obsession. He has another internal discussion with a personality. This time, it seems to be his inner artist. Our Mort loves the feet, the artsy one does not. Important distinction. Everyone stares at him in creeped confusion. I can't tell if the personality is coercing Mort or taking over Mort. It rotates. Lots more social commentary and sophisticated critique of the avant-garde. He eats fruits whole, but that's all pretty normal, of course, for this show. In the corner, we once again see his home planet painting. Funny, I was just about to say his obsession was alien and fueled by a desire to return to his home constellation. His goal in this episode was to paint Julian the way he truly sees him. His house is full of foot art, and he wants to mount the real deal eventually. Julian finally grants Mort foot access, and Mort screams, I love you, the feet! He throws his face and tongue all over them. See? He butchers grammar and says, the feet, as if it's an individual entity he's obsessed with, not some sort of usual atypical attraction. He hates other feet in comparison to Julian's, but he'll take what he can get. In episode 4, he has a minutes long fart. He refuels by breathing in, once again proving him to be a hollow entity in essence. He wishes to be first on the sacrifice list and actively demands danger. He kicks out another sacrifice to take his place and says, I'm first on the list. Read it and weep, Gramps. He's talking to Hector, an elderly lemur in the kingdom. I was all like, aren't you older than him, Mort? And Hector literally follows it up with, you're older than me, Mort. See? Usually I have to highlight continuity like this, but here they are. Seconds later, confirming it for me. Accommodating show. So anyways, they catapult Mort far off the island, and then he suddenly appears right next to them. Changed. So when his altars come into the light, they can teleport him? This rabbit hole is degrading me. Mort says he floats real good because he swapped all his parts for wood years ago. The other character I do want to highlight is the only one I enjoy more than Mort. Another supernatural one that can aid in our mission here. That character is Todd. He is freaking hilarious. He's this little pageant boy who's always commanded around by that insane Karen soccer mom I mentioned before, Tammy. She's nuts, and screams his name, and he always stares blankly into space with the utmost creepiness until called upon by his mother, at which point he does something random but extremely talented. In this episode, he highlights his paranormality when he walks vertically down the side of a chest. Everyone's rightfully scared of him. His mom claims he can be activated. Whatever the hell that means. His default face is brainwashed, though, so I can certainly guess. He has this horrible, evil attack face that looks demonic. And then, in this episode, Tammy finally explains it. She laughs villainously, and no f***ing joke, claims that they can only stop him by driving a stake through his heart while a priest recites a ritual. Todd is possessed by a demon. She screams at him to let go of Maurice's jugular, and he goes back to Catatonia. He looks like Mort, and is important. This baby lemur is a key to a lock I haven't come across yet. 
But back to our good pal Mort, who disturbingly locks mannequins inside of his house and drops a boulder on it to put them out of their supposed bizarre misery. He puts on the wig again and plays some drums. Seconds later though, he's back to our Mort, and I can't tell if he's right here hallucinating identities around him or, or what. He spoons sand and then pulls a cannon out of thin air. Dread pirate, I say. People around him don't even question how he apports things anymore. Mort calls Julian handsome, but I know better. It's a twisted obsession. Even when he laughs normally, the subtitles default to calling it evil. Let it be known. Episode 5. Mort twerks on a pole to seduce a rooster. During alleged sensitivity training, Julian calls Mort a fun-sized trash goblin, and Mort loves it. Also calls him a worm-riddled peach pit and a second-hand donkey puppet, which Mort enjoys as well. Carl wants to keep Julian on his toes, to which Mort says, Don't even look at his toes! Julian kicks him, as per the usual. Here, we also get a shot of one of Carl's side hustles, which is freelance religious work. He screams, The power of the sky gods compel you! at Todd, causing him to float in mid-air and then thrash around. Demon child. <sighs> I'm getting exhausted already. I mean, it, it, there's so much. And then a lot of weird shit happens at once. Mort suggests that the Fusa have resorted to cannibalism. Mort implies he likes eating live chicken. Maurice lays an egg. Mort falls into a deep fryer and instantly turns into popcorn, then back again. Episode 6, more Mort madness. I think he somehow gets onto the mainland and then returns via parachute. A fork stabs him straight through the head, and he asks if something's burning, so clearly Mort has a brain, right? One that can be affected similarly to a human's. He later rolls around in an onion patch to protect from werewolves. There's some unique commentary in this episode on cults, and Mort gets hypnotized into being the evil cat of an evil, sophisticated crocodile who tries to usurp the kingdom. The show gets very, very, very weird. Mort then meows like the supposed cat he is. Probably genetic. I doubt it, but we shall see. Mort turns his head 180 degrees. Is he part owl? I doubt it, but again, we shall see. And it persists here as season 4 is pure insanity. Episode 7. Mort claims nobody ever asks about him unless he's under investigation. Based on his track record, it's certainly clear he's malicious indeed. Multiple arrests are quite likely in his past. Mort is asked if his family has had inbreeding, and he says he's his own grandfather. We soon learn that his dad was a bear, and from what I understand, we eventually meet Grammy Mort's husband, so clearly someone is lying somewhere. Does this inbreeding mean Mort has time traveled? We're in very close proximity to the bombshell episode, yes, but I don't know. Next up, Mort swims in a tub of toenails and squeals, Give it to me! as he fills his mouth with them. Tammy starts speaking in various extinct tongues when she presumes someone around her is possessed by a demon. She has clear experience with Todd. Mort then counters the notion that he breathes through his mouth when he dives in a pool and claims his gills are clogged with drain hair. This means he is also part fish. Mort panics and needs to consult his inner voices. One of them calls him Mortimer and tells him not to blow it. This new name counters when he called himself Mordecai, and brings up the possibility that he just adds stuff onto his name quite randomly. But his original name is just Mort, which, as I've said many times before, is Latin for death. Several more Morts show up in his mind and show that they've got a whole system in this psychotic inner world. They're starting to truly build on Mort's lore, finally. He gets married to Pam, a woman who tries stealing the throne. They accuse Mort of being a completely unknown species, to which he replies he's fully aware that he's a medical marvel whose father was a bear. So much is going on now, it's madness, and they're revealing things about his genealogy. Remember Sage? Yeah, his huge bird comes crashing into a rock and he heals it with magical tears. His last name is Moondancer. He has got to have Sky God relations somehow. Maurice claims to be surrounded by crazy people, and that is very sadly true. Turns out Pam illegally married Mort and is a con artist. Turns out she also married that zombie who then reconnects with Mort and goes on a cruise. Mort, all done up in his usual blonde wig. It can't get any crazier, but I positively know it will. Episode 8, 
Mort is leaking something. Later says he burst an artery as well. Also raises his eyebrows, winks, and says he'll take some fine tunage if we know what he's saying. <laughs> Hmm. Pop culture commentary abounds in this episode. Mort thrusts the air, zero exaggeration. Then he roasts someone and later says, oh, I can handle this. Happy to do it, in fact. He nefariously chuckles. Another persona? I'm losing it. There's so much. I mean... I just can't. What? So you're telling me... No. No, 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 no. We focus on Mort and the supernatural that surrounds him. Now is not the time for Puss in Boots. Shrek may tie in later, but for now, this makes no sense. Moving on. Episode 9, he's electrocuted, showing he does have a skeleton once again. It is implied that Mort helped brainwash some of the citizens, but finally, we've made it to the episode where everything, everything that they've ever built up unravels. The beginning of not just this show's madness, but what it does from now on, which is sci-fi madness. Absolute pure insanity and why I'm making the theory. Season 4, episode 10. You seriously all have to watch this one for yourselves. They don't even stall the inevitable that is this episode. Julian has that science dude, Timo, build a cloning machine so that he can love more of himself. He does, and various Julians of different personalities come strutting through. Lastly, a female Julian pops out and Julian falls in love, making Mort jealous. Mort loves her feet too, though, and thus he finally loses it and takes it upon himself to activate the machine again with his butt. He wants his very own Julian to, quote, cuddle, bathe, and feed while he's strapped to a high chair. The machine takes his signature instead of Julian's and reaches into another universe populated entirely by evil Mort clones. Turns out Timo somehow accidentally built an interdimensional portal and merely has let through alternate versions of Julian. In the Mort universe, there's thousands of them, who all bow and pray to their leader, Mordecus Khan, who sits on a giant throne of skulls in the middle of a barren wasteland filled with foot effigies. To those who thought I was joking, I have just stumbled upon the largest untapped gold mine in the known history of fan theorizing. They all march right through the portal, and Mort screams that his nightmares have come to annihilate him. I assume he could detect their existence through the fabric of reality? Or his memories? I don't know. Every single Mort in Mordecus Khan's army seems to have the abilities of our regular Mort, and they begin destroying Madagascar while chanting, Mort, 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 Mort? Mort, 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 Mort? Their war horns are gigantic woodwinds that are not blown into with the mouth, but with the Anus. They have endlessly long farts that announce their presence. Mordecus himself shows what a mort is truly capable of when he claims to smell the fear of other lemurs as he conquers this universe. He claims to be supreme leader of the Mortverse, which to me either means the multiverse in relation to the mort residing in each one, or it's just the name he gives his own barren universe. Perhaps his horde consists of every other Mort in every other universe he has conquered? Anyways, the gang tracks down Mort and forces him to down coffee so Smart Mort will return. Once he does, things come full circle. Smart Mort claims he has a friend who can explain the multiverse. And we cut to none other than Pineapple in his limbo, communicating with those on the ground. How does Smart Mort know Pineapple? How? How on earth? Is this thing even Julian's ancestors? Who knows? Smart Mort has seen it all. Pineapple then calls in Dr. Watermelon Balking to explain the multiverse, utterly obliterating the fourth wall in the process by speaking directly to the quote, kids at home. Pineapple says he owes a lot of money to fruits and veggies of other universes. At this point, I feel like Pineapple is sort of the god or a god of our universe, interpreted the only way the characters know how. Smart Mort refers to regular Mort as himself once again. Normal Mort calls Smart Mort icky. So is he a persona or just Mort? Answer me, show, damn it! Smart Mort knows so much. He's got all the knowledge of Mort's immortal life, an anomalous elder god trapped 
as a mouse lemur in the corner of a forgotten island off the coast of Mozambique. Holy hell. He says every mort in every universe loves the feet, and he gets distracted back into normal mort, forcing them to copy him again. Mordecai says that no universe has ever dared face him. They chant their anthem, Mort, 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 we come to fight, we come to kill, today you die, you surely will. They vow to leave no survivors and dine on the tears of the dead. The clouds open up and reveal Limbo as the divine fruits watch down on the ensuing massacre. They pump up a massive balloon of a lemur foot and it entrances the Mort horde. They run straight up a cliff face for it. Mordecus ain't so easily swayed, I can see why he's their ruler. On second glance, I do think the barren wasteland is in fact a completely ocean-free version of our world, right outside Madagascar. After all, it's through reality, not through space, and they drop down out of the portal that is elevated on our side. Mordecus nearly cuts off Julian's feet to take as a necklace, but they close the portal in time. Smart Mort returns to the depths of Mort's mind as well, claiming it causes a spatio-temporal imbalance for him to be out. He's multiversal, I know it. Well, that was draining, and we haven't even gotten to the 16-part episode yet. <sighs> and now we do. Episodes 11, 12, and 13 of the fourth season follow a similar plot that culminates in a massive cliffhanger that is resolved in a whopping 13 more individual episodes of the serialized drama known as as exiled. It's basically season four and a half of All Hail King Julian, if such a thing existed, and Netflix has, for some reason, separated it as its individual show, because it's more dramatic and chapter-based. In episode 11, though, Mort says he has an imaginary friend named Nathan, which, let's face it, another persona. Mort says he likes his Julian soggy and alive. He gets struck by lightning through a roof. Mort once again mocks Maurice's crying by saying, Haha, he's not dead inside. This presumes Mort thinks the norm is to be dead inside, i.e. Mort is dead inside. Mort's electrocution now causes him to attract appliances, and a Roomba chases him, to which he yelps, Call an exorcist. So the enormous plot starts right around here, where Sage's brother, Koto, king of the mountain lemurs, comes in and lies about his kingdom being destroyed. It's all a plot to take over the lemur kingdom with his warrior species. Sage is rightfully suspicious. Episode 12. While the mountain lemurs plot and raid, Mort removes all of his organs. Some of them are metallic. Mort then, oh, to my great pleasure, gets a DNA test, and the kingdom's creepy doctor, Dr. S. the Snake, is even terrified and disturbed by the results. The show then plays creepy music, as he reads off the results in a very similar fashion to how I did in part one. Mort nods as Dr. S. says Mort's only 40% lemur, but 60% bear, starfish, sand, potbelly pig, cactus, and a spool of copper wire. Mort corrects him and adds on wood chips to which Dr. S acknowledges as well. This is all only to Mort's knowledge there could be more or ones missed on the test. Perhaps these are just from the organs he's replaced. Mort beeps when he's nervous. Oh, Julian has a dream of a parallel timeline where he never met Maurice, and in it, Mort claims he made a dream catcher woven from Julian's uncle's fur. Again, Julian's uncle is one of the show's villains constantly trying to reclaim the throne, but we'll get more on him later. Maurice turns out to be an eye eye, a different species of lemur, and apparently this species is known for sacrificing beautiful eye eyes to what they call bell gods at the center of the earth? Sounds a lot like sky gods, but we see these. They're the same ones I briefly mentioned were plotting from before. They are literal bells underground. They have prophecies in a whole society, and they foretell a time of lemur war which is about to come. Season 4 finale. Kodo conquers every Madagascar kingdom and enslaves everyone. Mort tries escaping by acting as if he's a drop-dead hot chick, and their guard is a handsome sailor. He's had some clear experience. He asks Todd not to judge him. Todd stares blankly into space, of course. With Kodo, it ain't personal. Conquest is just business. Julian does a dance-off, but fails from lack of endurance. Everyone calls Mort delusional, as he uses his teeth to drill out of the prison and save Julian. Mort distracts the execution snake via twerking hypnosis. Mort 
Epically enough is the last line of defense. The snake plays with its new food while Julian escapes on a submarine, starting up exiled. Chapter 1. Kodo wants to quote, make Madagascar great again. Mort is devastated and works like the other captives as an unpaid intern that carries enormous boulders on his back. I swear, Sage is like a parody of wisdom itself, and says his usual quote, something like, We are all just kicking the cosmic footy sack with a guy named Skeeter who lives in a van. This is the sort of stagnation everyone else is going through while Mort is taking action. He crawls up on his back like the cat he doesn't know he is, and consults his inner room of personalities once again. They brainstorm on how to kill Koto while acting in various ways and doing various bizarre things. One of them says, Oh, baby, daddy likey. Does this somehow imply Mort has absorbed his father? Thought he was a bear. Or does he just see him as a Mort now? How'd he absorb a bear? Maybe Mort has the unique power to absorb non-Morts, which puts him apart from the likes of the Mort Horde, and has resulted in a genetic soup? I really want a Mort v Morticus deathmatch. One of the mental Morts says to kill the other lemurs as well, and now we truly do get to see the sorts of evil Mort has rattling around in his soul. He laughs like the villain he is, and everyone is horrified. He's stupid, but he feigns stupidity to an extent as well. He plans to murder Koto straight up. Mort has a lot of hella wicked schemes, but he wily coyotes himself every single time, putting him in a full body cast. They soon later take it off because he regenerates quickly, of course. Koto is amused and makes Mort his jester. Chapter 2. Sage divorces his hawk, who he also raised from birth. Mort's rib punctures his stomach. Kodo relishes the job and forces Mort to consecutively smash plates on his own head. He dismisses Mort as ignorant, but we once again zoom into his mind and see his evil personalities claiming they understand everything. The little good and bad voices on Mort's shoulders don't exist, for he has a whole society of differing perspectives that take their own spotlights. They do this constantly in Exiled, and they all try possessing him to no avail. Chapter 3 Todd is eaten by a snake mid-dance routine. Speaking of snakes, Mort slithers like one during an escape attempt. Serpentine ancestor? Wiggles like a slug, too. We learn that the psychic lizards can teleport. During another escape, Mort seduces the same guard with his Hey, sailor! talk and asks for her hand in marriage. His inner voices object to it. With Julian gone, his personas are really active somehow. One of them suggests a prenup. He manages to win the guard's affection by moving her one inch after slamming into her from deflecting off a tree she punched him into. A burglar persona seemingly takes over Mort. We also see a completely different character who actually looks like he has true dissociative identity disorder. Chapter 4. Kodo asks Mort why he constantly giggles evilly as he plots more escape routes. In other news, a fish that barfs mud vomits up a human hand that grants Clover a weapon to save the kingdom. <laughs> More super neutrality. Mort creates a play to distract Kodo during their escape and calls everyone Babe. Four of his personalities mock and chastise him about his failure of playwriting. He gets a little immersed since he's only used to writing novels, but his play is successful and they all tunnel out. Chapter 5. Sharks can talk underwater. Apparently dolphins in this universe are, quote, villains that sell other sea creatures to Russian oligarchs. This isn't too far-fetched. I remember an evil dolphin from the Penguins show too, but that's for later. Tammy tells little Todd to, quote, inhale mama's wind, baby, as they escape through the tunnel. He is right behind her butt. What? <laughs> They then use Todd's face to shove her up through the ground. What what? Kodo finds them. The fez-wearing crocodile ambassador calls Mort a yeti. Genealogical confirmation, Mort gets a couple of Mordecai voices in the corner of his head to aid him, and these two are fluffy yeti-esque savages, one of which threatens to bite through Kodo's Achilles heel. They escape in a cloud of fart, while Tammy sicks Todd on the guards. Then something top-tier shocking occurs. A topic that I've also done rigorous theories on in the past. Mort escapes Kodo by diving into a random glowing wardrobe in the jungle which leads him down a tunnel and out into our world 
where he is a real mouse lemur in real footage of Madagascar in nature. <sighs> His crazy grandma is there and she says, You've come down the wishing well. Stay with us. This is the real you. I can't tell if this is in his mind, or if the wardrobe literally led to this sort of real-world heaven haven. But either way, it's perplexingly cross-dimensional. Unless it's not. You see, I have reason to believe, based on the granny's wording, that this is the real Mort, and the entirety of Madagascar is an elaborate fiction that he's trapped himself in for the sole purpose of self-defense in the real world. It makes sense. Everything radiates into his world. This seems to be implied by this scene, but all this would mean is that Mort is a sort of eldritch god of his own universe. Essentially then, whether this is truly in his mind or not doesn't change a single bit of the stakes and purpose of what's going on in the show. Either Mort is an elder god who built our universe, or he's a Goodman's mouse lemur that is the elder god of his own fictional universe, who hides there in his stories for safekeeping. This is presented as a random offhand joke and I understand why. It's irrelevant, because we already knew Mort was some sort of omnipotent ageless deity. It's mostly likely that this is just more of his crazy, indescribable, hyperdimensional inner mind, hence his granny also being there. It's a joke meant to confuse theorizing, basically, and I won't be confused by it. He flies back out of the wardrobe and promises to fight to the end. Julian is still trying to get back home, and he meets this enormous emotional tentacle in the depths of a cavern who claims to be an alien from another planet confirming alien's existence outright. Mort falls for his own traps, but doesn't die of course. I was all fine and good until another character, Gigi, reveals she has a photo on her wall of another real-life animal. Where do we go from here? It's like Spongebob, where it's sort of just perspective that makes these characters animated? Who knows? I've also theorized the exact opposite. Say this sentence ten times fast to your therapist. The evil dolphins bully the nerdy tentacle alien and threaten to sell him to Russia. You can't make this shit up. Which is why I'm appalled that some DreamWorks and Netflix writers actually managed to do just that. Mort then explains to Gigi that scientists claim he has unclassified pheromones that make no sense and could possibly be alien. Mort outright confirms here that he's a genetic anomaly from outer space who has no memory. This is sadly a huge step. Sadly because of how ridiculous it is, and sadly because it means I can't get the chance to theorize on it as much. It also means Mort is aware of what scientists are and has had time to be studied. The question is, is he referring to when they came and kidnapped him in that other episode, or has he been a wanted anomaly for generations? You know, I was told by you guys a few weeks ago to visit something called the SCP Wiki, because apparently my terminology and theories sound similar whenever I go off on an eldritch entity. I must say, it's a pretty interesting website. Hashtag non-spawn. Everything to do with Mort is intentionally contradictory in an interdimensional sense. Maybe this whole show is just the sub-dimensional brainchild of its writers. You know, that's probably the single most complicated way I could possibly explain All Hail King Julian being a fictional show. Julian replaces the king shark that the dolphins kidnapped with a warhead, which they sell to... the Russians. <laughs> Comedic commentary. This show is truly starting to remind me of Twin Peaks. That Mort dream was mere foreshadowing of Exiled. Chapter 6 of 13. Mort furiously screams at Timo to open the freaking door. <laughs> Apparently Sage was in an alien support group. I swear this show is building to something enormous. Commentary on charlatans, blah 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 blah. Mort is hit with his own cannonball, scorched by a blowtorch, blown up with a volume of TNT I would calculate had I not been in a rush to get this out due to the upload scarcity at the moment. Scarcity is because of this show. I have done nothing else. No worry, I'll be uploading a lot to make up for lost time because the one thing this show has been good for is ideas. In this episode, Julian finds that Russian space monkey again, and so much here leads me to believe Mason and Phil were also rejected test subjects. Perhaps all the monkeys were, and these ones build a massive blimp similar to the plane in the film series. The other thing that crosses over from this show are the sky gods, which either do work by coincidence when Julian sacrifices the shark in film 2, or don't work at all because they're not on Madagascar, and the gods seem to be localized physical pagan deities. 
Chapter 7. Mort gets inside Timo's pod and discovers he's been held hostage by his own security system who gained sentience and has been pretending to be a strict mother. Clover is somehow given a paranormal nightmare from Sage's mentor, warning her to exit the cult she joins and then deprograms. Yes, that has been a crucial plot point, and their seminars look like the Red Room from Twin Peaks. Back to Mort, where this time, Mort's head cranks a whole 360 degrees. Owl Eye says, That seems to be the limit as he cranks it right back. Chapter 8. They reprogram the robot and it aids Mort and Timo on a new quest. Apparently Hans, that zombie Mort keeps losing and finding again and has a true love for, has his own zombie wife and two zombie children. It infuriates the wife when Mort recruits Hans and he says, Come on, kick me, I deserve it. I can take it. I'm mostly sawdust and bird guano in the middle. Okay, just gonna add that to the list. Didn't show up on the genealogy test. Yep, Mort can certainly take that kick, immortal headass. Julian and Maurice are still trying to get back to stop Kodo, and now they've encountered Fusa, who they turn on each other. The Fusa use electric saws, laser beams, automotive accidents, atomic and nuclear bombs, plane crashes, and Godzilla to fight one another, none of which we see outside of Julian's reaction to it. Sage's mentor swaps the minds of Clover and Sage so Clover can use his body to save the kingdom. Turns out it was probably another paranormal lucid dream. Outside of the mind space, he's a floppy fish. The zombies suggest Mort gets his own army. Mort laughs evilly, transitioning us into Chapter 9, in which Mort downs some coffee, permitting Smart Mort to rip through and seize the assets of Mordecus Khan. During transformations like this one, Mort's body physically doubles for split seconds. I wonder if Smart Mort is the original. He says, You don't know how much it hurts me to me here. I'm just too smart. The mom robot questionably sings him a song about how if you're smart in life, suppress it because the world loves stupid. This parallels exactly what I think Smart Mort did. Sort of like my theories on Patrick Starr, he defends himself with a stupid alter ego he gained. Perhaps. Again, could be either or, as Mort himself isn't fully stupid either. The song is basically a hardcore satire on the concept of it's okay to be you. Contextually, this show actually makes some sense, sadly. It's not all fast-paced slapstick at all. Julian nearly is killed by Fusa, but claims it is plot armor that keeps him alive, and he does a Matrix kick to perfection. Once Smart Mort enters Khan's universe, he disappears out of fear and leaves them all stranded amidst the army, and a furious Mordecus. Carl appears to save the day somehow, and Maurice is kidnapped, but everyone. You must know this. Chapter 10. Everything ever is explained. Holy hell is it ever. The show damn near ceases to be mysterious after this. I mean, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. But look at the time. I simply cannot edit all of this, and I've yet again tested my video lengths way too hard. I have limits, but again, I will edit the third and final section of part two ASAP. But again, honestly, as you'll see, at this point, it's just part three and four for algorithmic sake. <laughs> Subscribe. Do not miss anything. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at the Theorizer YT, and until the very soon next time, I'm the Theorizer. Mort is a weakling, wimpy, limp, and freaking shit. How dare he do what he has done? I'll relay his crimes in a format as synonymous, for I am anonymous and mimic Mort the ominous. Now, he's out of his mind, but the other Morts are not. His genetic code is shot like the grandmother he fought, buried her in a well, and hell if he ain't a malicious and delicious little eldritch entity Lovecraft sent to me on the silver platter lined with horrific insanity. He deserves as few videos as possible. Unfortunately, I've succumbed to DreamWorks and their awful show. What the hell is wrong with me? Am I free? Even lost in the lore? Maybe. I mean, I'm on video four. He gets what he deserves, nothing less and nothing more, which is one measly attempt at countering this it ain't glorious, but as expected with the worst lemur, sacrificial lists identify him as their first lemur. Hell or high water, I will rip apart this night creature as his war crimes span the planet in this double feature roast. More is fishy in his genes, are we surprised as it seems? He's an alien from deep space with a feet taste, sitting, eating Cheetos and Doritos and his dipping chips slouching in-house on couch, throwing shade like an eclipse.
Everyone, you are now on part four of my theory on Mort from Madagascar. Make sure to click the link above now, which will allow you to see the videos as a playlist I've made, as intended. Technically, again, this is part two, section three, but for the algorithm, part four. For those who are prepared for the rest of All Hail King Julian, it is time. We are nearing the end of Exile, and here we are at probably the best episode in the whole series. One of the best animated kids TV episodes in recent and inexperienced memory, Carl claims to be responsible for Koto's conquest, but that's questionable. Julian blows up on another mine and appears back in limbo. The pineapple claims that this is, in fact, Frank Rilla, otherwise what the lemurs know as the heaven of the sky gods. They tease if this is still all in Julian's unconscious mind, but we saw Clover's grandma unrelated to Julian. We know better. The fruits hold a divine trial and bring in all of the dead characters to testify against Julian. Someone's also there as a recurring joke who's actually still just alive. The fruits and veggies are focused on Madagascar as if it's the center of the universe. They are its gods. Julian returns to life eventually and no time has passed, like some sort of heaven time dilation. Meanwhile, Maurice has been kidnapped by the underground bell gods. Turns out the bells are actually just snails in disguise who are terrified of the surface due to French cuisine. Apparently they have a worldwide network of underground tunnels and their leader is named Jingle Jangle. Maurice is the chosen one, but the bells he repeatedly forsakes until they manipulate him and then he doesn't. But the most important plot of this episode is of course Mort, who has returned to the Mortverse. Morticus claims to have been waiting 1,000 years for his battle with Mort, implying either time dilation or Mort's true age. He claims he's been searching since their last encounter, and that both he and Mort are immortal, multiversal conquerors. Mort has forgotten all of this somehow, and he asks if he missed the first act. Fourth wall break! Apparently, Morticus wants to absorb Mort? just like Mort absorbed countless versions of himself from the countless universes, but forgot due to the consequences of interdimensional travel. These are the personas in his mind. Brilliant. It makes him bloated though, apparently. Morticus mutilates the mom bot and claims there can only be one leader of the Mortverse. Morticus owns Mort in the most obscene ways possible. They enter the ring and a wigged female Mort holds up the round signs. The Mort horde whistles in sensual approval. Morticus sniffs Mort creepily and claims to smell his soul. Morticus wants Mort's endless absorbed spirits for himself and Mort retaliates by showing a picture of the foot constellation to entrance him. It's super ineffective. The feet are the only restraint on these otherwise anomalous immortal entities, and Mordecus overcame it. He eats the diagram. Mordecus threatens Julian's feet, enraging Mort while the army chants. Mort eats some dirt and vomits, slamming Mordecus into the portal machine, electrifying him to death, and funneling his spirit into Mort. I do believe Mort has now absorbed everyone Mordecus had inside of him. All of the multiverse Morts he absorbed. The portal breaks. Chapter 11 is equally absurd, to be honest, you'll see. Julian starts it off by highlighting how he misses the usual simple standalone stories. Mort bangs his head and it sounds like metal. Mort is aware of this madness. He calls the whole plotline, quote, totally freaking insane. Do you know what else? Every single character in this show is implied to be Jewish and bisexual. It's a very specific sort of universe. Sage, Astral projects in a way that allows him to physically interact. Now without coffee, Timo uses the mom bot to hypnotize Mort with a laser, sending him into his subconscious where he can manually find smart Mort to fix the portal home. The first thing Mort observes when he enters his mind is that it's dark in here. You and me both, Mort. In various rooms of this haunted mansion of a mind, we see a trampoline Mort, a trike Mort, twin Morts in diapers from The Shining, a Mort that crawls on the ceiling and cranks its head 180 degrees before threatening to eat him, so on. I think this is an owl-spider-Mort hybrid. I don't know. There's also a Spanish Mort and the Mort from when he was in that butterfly costume. I don't know what is what, that'll be for my actual theory videos on this topic. 
They all stalk him down the halls. He is chased by his own actions, while terrifying circus music blares in the background. My question is, how far and wide has Mort been? This is quite a sophisticated human structure. A foot mansion. Maybe it's a good thing he's forgetful. Then his granny shows up. Just as Mort finds Smart Mort tied up, Smart Mort says, The spider has ensnared the fly. As his grandmother enters the picture, her plan is to escape the creepy mind prison, take control of Mort's body, and replace him. I wonder where Mordecus is hiding in here. Clearly the granny's been here some time because she's mastered the arts of mental competence when she levitates and slams the door on Mort. Smart Mort seems capable of anything, but it's Mort who tries using his quote big thing to will open the door and does. Then granny comes in with a spiked ball and chain containing a mine on the end. Mort changes it, and his grandmother accuses him of voodoo, which leads to the most epic Matrix parody anti-gravity inception battle I've ever seen. Mort says the only one who gets to do weird stuff in his brain is him. They punch each other, changing gravity, as the granny rallies up dozens of other Morts to destroy him. Mort vomits a beam of pure light and seemingly annihilates all of the other spirits before repurposing the mansion as a field in the Alps. They battle like two titans across a stormy sky before the granny calls him out for consuming her essence and she tries melting him with x-ray vision. Mort spawns a deep wishing well and traps the cursed night creature at the bottom. With Smart Mort saved, the portal is fixed, and they escape with the Mort Horde. Despite now knowing what he is, Timo cries when he thinks Mort has died, calling him just the child. Um, no. Certainly not. Exiled Finale, Part 1. Clover astral projects and goes to space with the Mentor, only to suddenly appear in similar Alps to Mort's mind, where she meets a butterfly that I theorize is the inner soul of Sage's hawk, or not. She finds Sage's soul, and together, they possess his body and save Julian's life by destroying the execution machine. They expend massive levels of soul energy and punch Kodo with the power of ripping space-time. It's not enough. Then Carl reveals he has the most elaborate backup plan in known history when he reveals he built a space station which eclipses the sun and charges a laser to fry all of the mountain lemurs, it crashes into the moon and blows up. Then the Russian monkeys return. They crash into a volcano due to the oligarch dolphins. Then Mort shows up. Thousands of the horde rain from the sky portal and consume the enemy, while Maurice and his army of bell snails come from beneath and corner the mountain lemurs on all fronts. Turns out this was the war foretold by the leader of the bells. If you were to enter the show without seeing any episodes here, you'd wish for the end of humanity. No writer sane or insane, should conjure such ideas. Todd seemingly cannibalizes the mountain lemurs when his mom screams to go after their jugulars. The thousand morts are shot from crossbows and explode on impact. Sage drills down by meditating. The bell snails get Maurice to fart and summon the great jingle jangle through a portal from who knows where. He arrives, and he's like a hundred feet tall or something. He gets hit with a tiny bit of salt and shrivels up completely. Wow. You know, I'm also shocked at how much Maurice hates Julian in the films. What happens between them, if anything? Kodo nearly kills Julian, but Mort redirects the spear and pierces someone else's butt cheek. It is now the second half of Exiled's finale. Archaic war commentary abounds. Pineapple literally narrates it. He calls it the Battle of Booty Ridge. The soundtrack's been killer these past few episodes, and all the other kingdoms bow to Julian, and Mort claims without the feat his life would be twice as meaningless as it already is. Tammy snaps picks as Todd mulls the enemy some more. The tentacle comes back and kicks butt with his baseball dad, who appears from a portal in the sky spontaneously. They defeat Kodo, but he returns on a hawk and kidnaps Julian. Sage and he have a sky battle in which they hella bitch slap each other and crash from hundreds hundreds of feet in the sky. Sage spares him, but Julian accidentally topples his statue and it crushes him to death. They blame Maurice. Mort goes for the feet, thinking, quote, This time will be different! Spoiler alert, it's not. Dude gets punted into next Tuesday. Gigi hooks up with the tentacle's dad. Clover and Sage nearly kiss, teasing an epic romance soon to be in a kid's show, but then they flat out zoom up and show Mort is making out with Zora right above them, aggressively, intimately. They married. All of the heaven ghosts show up and wave, like at the end of Star Wars Episode 6, except Kodo appears like Anakin, and he didn't redeem himself. 
and I haven't seen the Star Wars films. Everyone is happy, goes their separate ways, the Horde goes off to live on an island, the Russians cause an incident with their warhead. Julian humps the throne and Mort calls it, quote, one lucky chair. Exit stage exiled onto the final season. Final season premiere. Mort gets kicked over yonder and claims he don't want to die this way. If he remembers any fragment of his full life, maybe then he can be killed, not just absorbed by similars? This episode thrusts one truth in our faces hard. The Sky Gods aren't hiding anymore. A huge 2D hand reaches from the heavens and gives Julian a keyboard infused with energy. Oh, oh, wait. Never mind, that Julian's just dreaming. But would you honestly blame me for presuming otherwise? This also means Mort's statement about death is dubious. When Julian awakens, Mort relishes over him per the usual and then lambasts Maurice for getting snail mucus on everything. Mort requests a technical toenail garden. I don't know what the hell that means. Mort has some feminine oviparity in his genome too, it would seem, as Zora demands that they reproduce, and he says he hasn't laid an egg in 40 years, and it hatched an abomination. Part bird. Tammy claims her son is woke. Sage spoons his hawk. The second we get back to this episodic format, there's loads of social satire again. This time about criticism, safe spaces, forced positivity, and participation awards. A lemur screams at a cantaloupe, What do you want from me? I wonder if it's a heaven fruit. Alien music does play. Todd nearly dies again. Then I'm pretty sure he eats like half the population again. Mort advertises to children how he will support you if you rub his belly and it'll cost ya. Purely disturbed. Julian feigns an NDE, and Mort cries, then snaps on some gloves, wiggles his fingers, and thirsts, as they say. Episode 2. They break the fourth wall by mocking a flashback. Propaganda commentary that devolves into insanity. Mort and Zora get freaky, if they weren't already. It was only a matter of time before they pulled a radioactivity joke on Mort, and here it is. He swims in a toxic watering hole and then glows green. He calls everyone neurotic, and then his teeth fall out. He then hops in a densely toxic pool, and poisonous gas explodes from his orifices as he vomits brown tar before bubbling, transmutating into popcorn, and screaming his skin off. He calls everyone overreactive as a skeleton, proving once again and for all that he has some bone structure. Maurice is an ancient aliens conspiracy theorist. Same. Episode 3. Julian has a nightmare about Todd being snatched by a monster. Apparently, it was somehow real. Tammy scared it off, but Todd was not left unscathed. Everyone automatically assumes Mort was the monster because, well, you know why at this point. He sits in the corner of a creepy cave and says, <laughs> not me with his granny's wig on. At this point, he's just embracing what he is, considering we know his granny is currently trapped down in the mind well. Todd's dad calls him, quote, a delusional little girl who sadly must be put down. Butterfish is his dad's name, and he is indescribably dumb in the best possible way. Everyone keeps accusing Mort of being a horrific and murderous night creature, and he even admits to having been cursed many, many times. Julian's parents show up and admit they single-handedly repopulated the kingdom, answering the inbreeding questions from much earlier, and also why everyone claims to be cousins in this show. His parents also then shatter the fourth wall when they criticize Julian for battling Kodo an entire season. Uncle King Julian walks in and calls his sister Babe. Now they're just plain R-rated. LMFAO ho. We finally get a new, truly unique moment from Mort when he reveals something we didn't know yet. His descendants. He says to let Julian cry it all out as it works on his grandchildren. Instead of leaving it as an offhand comment, Maurice once again asks Mort to elaborate, to which Mort immediately forgets he even mentioned them, and panics, asking, How did they escape? Don't let them find me! He then shoots a spider web and confirms he is indeed part spider as he hides on the ceiling. Clearly, whatever eggs he's hatched weren't just random things. They were characters who I'd like to meet, actually, and paired with his previous statement about dead butterflies, I bet they're spider babies. Julian keeps having dreams within dreams. This episode is packed, my god. I expected less after the jaw dropper that was exiled, but nah. Turns out the lemur werewolf beast is Julian, surprise surprise. 
It attacks a couple watching The Shining in which Mort is the twin girls like we saw in his mind, and Todd is Danny. They filmed this. Everyone keeps thinking Todd died, and his dad doesn't even recognize him, calling him a random little girl again. Later calls him his stepdaughter. A statue seemingly blinks. I don't know how much longer I can ramble off the, the unexplained supernaturality of this show. We're almost done. Mort breaks into a creepy situation just to say, tick, tock, tick, tock. Mort promiscuously dances in a cage at a night party and says, hey boys. Even Julian's parents are appalled. Text superimposes itself in a spatially 4D manner, nobody questions it, as it is post-productive editing. I'm seriously losing it here. Apparently Julian's transformation is just a really bad milk allergy. Okay. Episode 4. Todd's dead eyes are brought up. Maurice gets money for dancing, and even admits that the only reason he's loved by anyone is for his thick booty which Julian promptly slaps. What? They show Maurice a picture of a hyper-realistic cat, so he'll cry and overload a robot's emotional apperception. This episode has a whack timeline, and Mort claims to have been trapped in a pie for years. Then he dives into a volcano in the name of Julian. This whole episode was a story Julian made up, but again, like all Madagascar metafictions, it could all be true and no eyes would nor should be batted. But then at the last second, Mort reveals he's a robot. A joke, a thriller cliffhanger. Episode 5. Mort sniffs a new chick, and Julian hires Todd to be the cool kid in his entourage. Tammy cries, Butterfish eats his fingers. Julian claims Todd is three days old. Julian is not like Mort, Julian is hyperbolic. Therefore, Todd is most likely not three days old. Mort is fired for the sake of Todd's position, and Mort screams bloody ageists as he's evicted from the room. Todd is in danger. Mort goes off the deep end of villainy, and Zora's still all like, huh? You see, Mort takes advantage of Tammy's anguish and steals Todd's identity. Social media and statistical commentary this episode intersperse with overt jokes. Mort's baby identity is sort of back, but this time he's pure malice. And indeed, here we get confirmation that all of Mort's alters are still alive and well, even after he light vomited on them. Todd briefly comes home to grab his toothbrush, and we get probably the most 180 degree scene from the sorts of things Mort does in the films. People who haven't seen this show still think Mort is a helpless little baby. Show them this. Mort mimics Todd to a T and then evilly growls, You made your bed, loser, and I'm laying in it. Mort holds Todd's family hostage with the sheer grit and uncanny horror of Tammy knowing something's wrong with her son, but being too terrified to act upon that pit in her stomach. Mort is exploiting this devastated fear Tammy has, and it is high-octane nightmare fuel. He seduces Tammy and brushes her with his tail. And the scary part of this is that Mort is intentionally honing the creepiness he's absorbed from his immortal lifespan. Todd says, Come at me, bro! And Mort threatens to rip off his face. Oh, you know, this episode has this kingdom thief lady, and I immediately thought it was that con woman from a few seasons ago. Turns out, it was true. See? You learn how to predict the unpredictable after a while of enduring this. It conditions you. Episode 6. Julian slaps Butterfish and he giggles like a geisha for some what the f out of character reason. Julian releases tea to the world like he did coffee so long ago, and Mort uproots everyone in the line, downs the whole drink, and then chomps the ceramic cup down as well. We know what coffee does to him, so what does tea do? Well, he screams in pain and then jets up with 60s glasses and an absolute hippie demeanor. He wears a flower necklace and leads a cult, all what with his, am I okay? Can I be reduced to two letters? and his society programs us like a robot escaping the mannequin factory. This would be mythical and shocking, but we know exactly what is happening here. It's just one of the absorbed souls being metabolically triggered like Smart Mort. They plan to tranquilize Mort if he gets even an ounce weirder. 
Honestly, at this point, the writers could do anything with Mort, and I'd accept it. So let's just go with the assumption that literally anything can happen to him. An infinitely variable Schrodinger scenario. Carl appears in Julian's bed and says that he has a proposition for him. The characters in this show are apparently endless, as Carl's brother then enters the picture as a bully who befriends the Russian dolphin jocks. <sighs> But Carl's brother does teach Julian about human culture, which is something he also needed knowledge of ever since learning of their existence in order to make him the character we know in film, and more importantly, in the other spin-off. Corporate and drug commentary. The tea is banned. Mort resorts to coffee, thus bringing out you-know-who. Clover pretends to be an international businessman with a mustache, and Carl's brother says, Big Daddy likes a solid seven chick with a nice bushy flavor saver under her nose. What? What? What is this show? What is this show? Mort acts as a distraction during a heist by posing as a mermaid. Are we surprised? No. He's wearing the granny wig. Carl takes credit for another manipulation. Shocker. Episode 7. Julian threatens to harm Mort, which Mort loves the idea of. Timo's robot censors Timo and says, There could be children watching. The ever-increasing fourth wall breaks aren't what get me, though. It's that she said there could be children watching, which means it's not the target audience. It all makes sense now. Mort downs a bunch of luminescent goop. Mort might be part plant. Mort sleeps in Zora's fat rolls. Mort approaches Julian and says, quote, he alters his DNA. Everyone thinks Maurice is dead, and Mort's first words are dibs on his hut. Pineapple breaks the fourth wall as a huge mango grows and starts talking. Maurice hates Julian for blame shifting. Mort beats up the jumbo mango. Two crocodiles fall on each other and say, Let my body be your pillow. Mort knows how cell phones work. The intelligent mango absorbs everyone's minds and heads for the mainland, so Timo calls the supply company of the luminescent goop that created it, and they immediately nuke it in the middle of the ocean. Episode 8, Mort says he's the smartest lemur in the world, which we know is true in many ways. We know sky gods are real in Madagascar, but apparently their lore entails Julian the first as being the first lemur who demanded the gods create more. This lore was structured by King Julian the Terrible, so take it all with a grain of salt. They flip through this book of lore, and Mort finds his page. He's in the history section as Adam, and a female Mort next to him is Eve. Clearly this book is all whacked. It has to be, because Granny Mort was his grandma. Unless she was just another multiverse version of Mort who took on the role as his grandma. Still not clear on how he absorbs species from any universe or just variants of himself, I don't know. But this book is messed. Julian too is terrified and asks how freaking old Mort truly is. Answer. If Mort was an interdimensional conqueror in some forgotten lifetime, similarly to Mordecai Khan, and he remembered his granny from 50 years ago, but couldn't remember absorbing her, and perhaps his life as a pirate, then how old? His timeline is all over the place, but let's just assume that he's thousands or millions of years old. He's a Goodman's mouse lemur on the outside, but inside he's added some genome elements. Mouse lemurs evolved 9 million years ago, so there's our limit considering his basis and alleged role as the atom of his species. No wonder he has a self-erasing memory. Infinite lifetime. Education system commentary. Todd is a child prodigy with a photographic memory. Mort wants to be a trophy wife for Julian and has his name engraved on him. Todd has PTSD and lives in crippling fear of his mother's screams. Mort poses as Todd in an academic competition, and Smart Mort takes the reins from the inside of his subconscious, or at least he tries to, but is convinced by the other spirits to do otherwise. Todd's demon comes out again when his head cranks 180 degrees and he mauls his kidnapper. Episode 9, they hold an election for a small ranking position in the kingdom and Mort is supposed to fail on purpose. Well, the show literally plays a scare chord as it zooms into Mort's head and shows that there is a whole council of political Morts inside of his mind mansion. The most extremist one, responsible for previously nuking something, locks the others up and takes control of Mort's body. We finally see this possession process. Political Mort then steals the election by hiding in Zora's she-mountain pouch, and saying cunningly persuasive things like, You need the Mort. You want the Mort inside you, whispering, Mort. Political Mort uses persuasion tactics like saying his opponent, Maurice, is in bed with the Fusa, and doesn't believe in the Sky Gods. Commentary. Everyone starts to love this Mort, so he tests their faith by blabbering gibberish on stage, and sure enough, they consider it genius somehow. He does this for 10 days in a row. 
They are voting for the position of Mango Manager or something, and while everyone watches Mort do a toilet dance, fruit flies eat all of the fruit and kidnap the kingdom to lay their larva. The other spirits break free and subdue political Mort before sending Chainsaw Mort into Mort's mental control room to saw himself free of the fruit flies. Maurice farts to kill the flies and the subtitles read sustained flatulence. Very few children will watch the subtitles, but I do, and whomever writes these knows what's up. Mort later vomits up thousands of dead flies and then becomes a giant one and flies away. Now he's part fly. Eating mass quantities alters his genome. That's how. Mort is Kirby. Also explains the black hole that is his stomach. I'll go in more detail later, but I'm almost certain that Mort, yeah, is like Kirby and has a pocket dimension inside of him. Episode 10. Carl and his bug move to Florida, but not before setting up a Willy Wonka tour of his lair to have someone replace him as, quote, the great evil. Meanwhile, Mort's grandpa shows up, and Mort remembers him from when he and his siblings were babies celebrating Hanukkah. See? Mort may be the OG, but he isn't the oldest. I don't even know how that works, but it does. This is Grammy's hubby, too. He's a convict. Once in Carl's tour, they even parody Wonka's subtle creepiness, just like I always do. Grandpa Mort was imprisoned, and Mort responds by describing how his voices get mad when he can't remember committing terrible crimes. Grandpa Mort implies all Morts are meant to be incredible forces of evil. Mort says he constantly has near-fatal levels of water retention. Regardless, Mort drinks an ocean and barfs up a billionth of a percent of it later on. His stomach is the pocket dimension mansion. Grandpa Mort says as evils in their family's blood, which is why they inhale essences. Clearly Mort forgot all of this as a coping mechanism to evade villainy, which reminds me of ABC's Fringe. Apparently, it was King Julian IV who locked Mort's grandpa away, and our Julian, Seven Greats' grandson the 13th, is going to pay for it. Mort is a wild collective soul jar soup, and his grandpa wants to enter the absorption too. He begs for Mort's evil, and when it's denied, he absorbs Mort himself. Mort is apparently too powerful and stupid at this point, and it blows his grandpa up. Mort nearly dies in the process, and Julian yet again screams, He's just a child! as he punches Mort a la bootleg CPR. Carl enters, and Julian sighs, We've already reached the climax. Mort keeps dying and resurrecting, and I'd like to see what the hell is happening from his mansion's perspective. Carl reveals it was all a setup, and then pulls out Moon Laser 2.0 to wipe Madagascar off the map, but Julian was always prepared to take advantage of Carl's laser obsession, and finally defeats him. More Maurice emotion mockery. Episode 11. Mort swallows a mine whole and blows up. The whole security system just so happens to land on the beach. Clearly a trap, but this is normal for the show too. Surveillance commentary ensues. Todd is arrested for a fashion faux pas. Prison commentary ensues. The episode is a musical. More Willy Wonka parodies. An episode too late. Someone watched it the night before and it influenced their screenwriting, I swear. Mort is back on them ancient aliens. The whole kingdom is imprisoned. Tammy is the boss around these parts if you know what I mean. Mort is verbally stated to be virtually indestructible. Apparently Mort never writes anything down because it can be used against him in court. Someone's been writing letters to Zora in prison and it turns out to be Julian's uncle again, who's also behind the surveillance trap. He's fallen in love with Zora though. Uncle Julian says he's spent so many seasons searching and finally he found true love. How does Mort, you know, her husband, react to this? He straight don't give a shit. He's all like, dodge that bullet. Oh, the savagery. And so here we are, series finale. Part 1. This episode is called The End Is Near, and Part 2 is called The End Is Here. Fourth Wall! Clover's gonna marry Sage, and Maurice says five seasons of romantic tension is more than enough. First, Mort gives marriage advice. He then suggests they lock Clover away until she forgets him. Clover's grandma, the one that proved the supernatural exists in this show, speaks to Clover from the sky god heaven when Sage marries Crimson instead. Clover undoes this and takes him for herself. They once again mock how Exiled was a season long. Mort suddenly reveals another new ability, which is apparently partial consciousness transference. He calls Hector an old man again, this time without speaking, and Hector hears him. Mort can read and write minds, which we've seen before. Must be a consequence of spiritual proprioception. Episode 13, the final episode, part two, whatever you want to call it, is the end. Oh, thank God. It's been weeks, months from my perspective, only an hour and a half for you guys. Mort keeps dozens of tombstones on standby in his house. He also claims he himself has been in jail for a large amount of time in the past. He has moments where he remembers and then doesn't question why he forgets later. Gigi says she hasn't seen many of the guests at Clover's wedding in multiple seasons. Get your fourth wall head-ass asses out of here. There's a banana meme lord. 
Heaven Fruit Guarantee. And you know what Mort's last words are in this show? I hope Clover and Sage last longer than my 12 marriages. Of course, most of my wives died of old age. We end where we began. Every character that ever died is partying with the fruits up in heaven, and then Alex the lion washes up in his box on the beach. Surprisingly, before my theories, my only question now is, does Mort include Zora or Pam in that wife count? He never formally divorced Zora or was ever legally married to Pam, but we know he has kids and grandkids, so does it really matter? We never met his parents either, absorbed guarantee. There is more, such as tying it into grander theories, but I did already get some of the big ideas I have out here. I'll recap them and discuss them and assimilate them later, of course, but before we do that, we still have to do Pell the Penguins of Madagascar, which is gonna be almost as long. Give me a month or something, like a break. I need to do other theories. My god, I feel so bad for the people who don't actually want to watch these Mort theories. The Bee Movie and Kung Fu Panda can also tie in here with animal intelligence, and that'll be later. Loose Thoughts. Morticus sounds like Mort's home planet, Footicus. And if Mort really is metallic inside, it makes sense why he bawled in film one when Maurice said the zoo gang was there for their precious metals. I'll discuss this more in the theory too, but in Madagascar 3, maybe Mort is implying a little more when he says, My tummy is speaking to me! Kirby head ass. For now, subscribe. Part 2 has rapidly, as you can see, become parts 3 and 4 as well, bumping us up to a 17-part series now. If this keeps happening, again, this is why I estimated a total of 25 parts. Who knows what the future holds in regards to the next videos. I'm sure my evidence delve into the Penguins TV show will take a couple of videos, but I foresee it being an easier task somehow. It will be next, whenever it will be. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next leg of this Mort theory, because once we finish all this evidence, we get to the answers not provided, the truth of where he's from and what he is. A unifying theory of Mort, because everything can fit together into one massive story. And once we solve Mort, then we get to the next chunk of this 25-part behemoth. We move on to the next film, and we create our DreamWorks timeline centered around Mort the Lemur. Follow my Twitter at TheTheorizerYT and turn on notifications here while you watch my other animated theories in the meantime. Those ones are mind-blowing. This has just been an evidence delve. I haven't actually done any critical thinking yet. I don't know why you guys love this so much. And until then, everybody, I'm exhausted, but still the theorizer. Mort is stupid, I am not. Bootleg SCP ass thought. Take him down, get him gone. Backhand him like Morty Khan. Peasants don't get presents, they get roasted like a pheasant. Madagascar's worse with this curse remaining alive and perverse. Evil, rotten, horrifying. Intel lacking, mortifying. Piece of shit anomaly. I will prove it, you will see. Okay, fine. I'll admit it. It was an April Fool's joke. I do not actually think that Mort is from another planet in the universe. The truth is, I actually think he's from another planet in a different universe, not only unrestrained regarding the fourth and fifth dimensions, but the sixth as well. He is not a timeline, or a mirror world, or a kaleidoscopic multiverse, he is more. He is an anomalous hell spawn more realistic and horrific than your microscopic imagination can fathom, and his timeless soul jar of a pocket dimensional stomach is expressly entangled with only the most extant of the quantum foam that is infinitely permeating reality. Mort is everything. This is completely legitimate. He simply is. And this is no joke. <laughs>and sorry for that teaser in the cold open, but so many of you still somehow think this is an April Fool's joke, so I had to bait you. I subverted you by referring to assumptions of his origin as opposed to this collective endeavor you assumed I was referencing. You must feel like quite the peasantile pufferfish. Now get your heads in the game because we're finally on the last stretch of evidence. The Penguins TV show. Here's the thing. 
Mort appears in every episode of All Hail King Julian, but not every episode of Penguins. Thus, I googled Andy Richter's IMDb page and highlighted every episode he appears in. That should for the most part be satisfactory, but it will be a focus shift for only the time being. He appears in, I think, most episodes anyways, and I've seen the show before, so I know the general plot. It's basically sometime after the first film, with the penguins and lemurs living in the Central Park Zoo. In most of his appearances, he's just the usual, subservient, cognitively dissonant Mort. Example, he says, I don't like drowning, but once again he then falls into the water and doesn't drown. In this show, though, Julian uses him as an object a lot more, such as a footrest or stuff like that. Let's vet. In Operation Plush and Cover, the zoo's visitors are consumed with purchasing the new Mort plushies because they're cute. There's then a recall, and the actual Mort gets swept along and returned to the factory to be burned. This factory is generally pretty hellish, like something out of Saw. It uses incredibly deadly weaponry to break recall toys. Maybe some of them were possessed. <laughs> I only kid, but seriously, they even point out how sick and twisted the disassembly line is. Mort is more incompetent in this show, like he's developed more memory loss and a dependency on Julian. I can't mention all of the collateral weirdness because Mort is more of a side character here, and thus I'm not watching the show as thoroughly. But apparently Julian has a holiday dedicated to himself, and it makes him angry and obsessive when not celebrated. I'm telling you, the reason this is taking so long is because I just sifted through hours upon hours of episodes that have nothing relevant to Mort. But from what I have gathered, it's that the crucial element that this show hammers home is not the insane number of absorbed souls or the shady alien history, it's his general inconsistency. But one main consistency, of course. Of course. The feet. In what I think is his first truly centric episode, Two Feet High and Rising, Mort shows us that it's still the same old him. In this episode, Julian outlaws people touching his feet, and Mort is crestfallen and grief-stricken. He obsesses over them in his dreams, and he gravitates towards them during bouts of sleepwalking. He chains himself to a tree and wakes up finding that the tree has been ripped out of the ground and he's on the feet again. Julian exiles him, and he panics drawing feet everywhere, short-circuiting. The penguins, oh, bless their competent ass soul try shocking him, putting him through therapy, among other things, and every time they try conditioning Mort away from the feet, he starts malfunctioning. Private analyzes him, and determines that Mort has associated feet with love. We know it's an addiction, though, not love. We've seen the other show. They overload his senses with a completely disgusting boot, and it conditions him away from feet completely, to the point where he obsessively destroys them. This tells me that Mort's problem isn't with feet, but rather with an all-or-nothing sort of obsessive attitude. He develops a potophobia. He's also very, very strong in this show, somewhat similarly to All Hail King Julian. Long story short, the conditioning is quickly undone. Next time he gets the chance, he grapples onto Julian's feet and starts panting, vibrating, and shaking violently. He claims to like basically everything, but that positive mindset is not wholly conducive to sanity. He claims to be puffy and complicated. I'm skipping around a bit here, so by the end, if there's anything I've missed, you must comment it. I'll speedrun the analysis during the beginning of the theory segments. And there is, you know, some consistency too, like how Mort recognizes characters and animals from the other show. In the episode Kingdom Come, Julian and Maurice eat bad lychee nuts and they lose their minds. They're cured later, and then the episode ends with Mort doing the exact same thing. Cut to black. I guarantee it doesn't even make a dent in the madness he already contains. In the next few episodes, we see some more oddities, such as Rico's pocket universe stomach. Funny enough, they send Mort in there to fix things. Another character with a pocket universe stomach. I must say there's an ounce of consistency in one way or another, as Julian says he was always picked last for sports in another episode, which parallels All Hail King Julian, where they explain he was always picked first, but only because he was prince and people wanted popularity. Semi-continuity. Which parallels how I am once again starting to think that this is a parallel universe. Mort gets squished constantly in this show, like completely flattened. Then comes the most memorable episode of the show, Mort Unbound. His second centric episode. Mort gets super strength after accidentally landing in Kowalski's experiment, and he has the power to crush through steel. He's like mountain lemur sized ish. He steals food for Julian by beating up gorillas and elephants and kangaroos. When he is denied a mere banana, though, he turns on Julian for the first time in forever and rises up. Kowalski's science has either brought out one of the dormant spirits or it's transformed Mort into his idyllic state, a trans-dimensional titan. 
he growls like a caveman and takes Julian's feet by force. Private enlarges himself to give Mort the antidote, and Mort is sad, revealing that it is just Mort, and he's merely disgruntled, radicalized by years of servitude. He wants back his power. Private also starts to like the strength, though, too, so who knows? Well, <laughs> I will, when we get to the theory. Things start to get more specific from here on out, less starring, more dedicated recurring. Mort freezes into a block of ice, but is fine, obviously. Julian is medically confirmed to be stupid. Mort is used as a wrench, and his head cranks something like 2800 degrees. The zookeeper Alice is suspicious of the penguin's intelligence, which is a presumably unimportant but collectively crucial factor. Mort apparently only needs one cherry in his whole food supply, and claims to be ever so lightly used. He obviously can eat more, such as chow mein in a prior episode, or some of the madness from All Hail King Julian, but the point about his metabolism still stands. I'm missing out on a lot of the penguins' dynamics by skipping through this show, but again, I've seen lots of it in the past, I know the general plot lines, and Mort is the only one who I need explicit consistency regarding, for now. In his next centric episode, Mort falls through a hole and his skull fractures on the concrete, causing the penguins to determine that Mort cannot feel pain, but is too dumb to follow any instructions. They study him, and thank God for that, because Kowalski discovers that Mort is invulnerable due to a halo of ignorance. He physically self-actualizes his ignorance and it prevents him from being harmed. His will is the universe's will. To do a dangerous job, the penguins attempt to remove all painful or likewise intelligent thoughts from their heads to try and replicate Mort's condition, but it just makes them completely oblivious to everything, including pain, whereas Mort, well, Mort is not quite that, as we well know. The penguins also fixate on the feet upon this intellectual decrease, prompting Mort to vow vengeance and scream at the heavens, invoking lightning. He uses the machine on the penguins again, causing them to regain awareness before he attacks their enemy himself and defeats it. Kowalski then drops a bomb on us when he proclaims, Truly his powers are too mighty for mere mortals. This is so crucial because it confirms that these producers knew what they were doing. Penguins was made long before All Hail King Julian, and here they are still touting immortality, consistency, intention, terror. Mort keeps eating glue, so on so forth. He's an honest-to-god self-saboteur. He can, as we know, detect stupidity and insanity in others, meaning he ain't it. He survives electrocution and tries ripping out his own jaw. His farts burn and he's attracted to danger. He gets flung into orbit with an elastic rope and he's completely fine in the vacuum of space, he just proclaims it's a little cold. A satellite explodes next to him with the energy of an enormous bomb and it just flings him back to Earth where he's of course fine. Also, we see the effects of this satellite explosion when a man's TV is cut off. He has a framed image of Nana's Mr. Chu on his wall. Is this man a Dubois? I suppose I'm missing important details like this in my analytical skimming, but I can always return once we move on to the DreamWorks timeline segment of this mega theory. Things like this, and other recurrent details I've mentioned. Mort yet again claims to know what he tastes like, proving more consistency, and yes, still, that he's eaten himself. In the season 1 finale, Mort lies about Julian's kidnapping so that he can caress the feet of his robotic replacement. He finally gives in, and we learn that Skipper's arch-nemesis Dr. Blowhole has kidnapped Julian. Mort starts to go insane without the real feet, and he gets this raspy, whispering, aggressive voice. He runs miles and saves the penguins right as they're about to be defeated by hijacking the evil computer and hacking the laboratory. Yay. On to season 2. Mort is mortified due to having a tail. His head makes thumping noises. The hell does that mean? <laughs> then we get one of the most memorable shots from this show. One of those shots so confounding that it sort of encapsulates why I'm doing this. Mort is either luck embodied or his will is known to the universe. Later he is crushed several times and we almost get to see his presumed feet dreams. He doesn't know the difference between sheep and roosters, he shoves sliced onion halves into his eyes, and he has a frictional coefficient of zero. Self-aware jokes everywhere, Mort becomes team leader and abuses his position of power to massage Julian's butt with a tooth. Kowalski's headass is a relatable headass. Mort has no regard for continuity, he's the one character who constantly disappears in one shot and reappears in another, but I'm not sure what to make of that. Mort mocks Maurice, semi 
my continuity. Mort praises his job security. Julian gets nuked by Rico. Mort relishes in the scent of fear and eats his mango neighbors. Semi continuity. Kowalski points out Mort's Latin death. Mort gets eaten by a snake and tries chewing a penny. Apparently, the fountain in the middle of the zoo is a wishing well and everyone starts getting things from it. Sky god migration? I'm not sure. Magic comes later in these theories. Alice, the suspicious zookeeper, wishes she knew what the penguins were really up to and the wish comes true, revealing their lair to her. She calls on the government to apprehend them and study animal human interrelations. I seriously need to come back to this show and rewatch the whole thing after I finish the Mort aspects because it will come supremely in handy when I discuss the magic and animal intelligence of the DreamWorks timeline. I'll probably also have to rewatch the Kung Fu Panda shows when I tie that in too. Anyways, Private wishes that none of this ever happened, thus rewinding the day and starting up a timeline where wishes weren't made. It's my theory that somehow the Sky Gods tie into this magic, and it's also my theory that if the Penguins of Madagascar is a parallel universe, then it has something to do with all of this rewriting history. Now, it's also possible that this was all in Private's mind after being concussed early in the episode, but then it wouldn't necessarily account for many of the perspectives of various characters in the episode. Kowalski also mentions this obvious cop-out, and then they have the obligatory, but maybe it was real, at the end. And thus, ambiguity. Mort later talks about Christmas Steve, a spirit who knows if you've been bad or good. Mort then gets the creepy voice he has in All Hail King Julian, and he says, That's creepy as he looks around suspiciously and slowly hides away. Semi-continuity. Mort introduces Julian to April Fool's Day, which is a huge coincidence considering my circumstances when starting all of this, and Julian goes around pranking everyone. When the pranks turn on him, Julian threatens to tell on everyone to Christmas Steve, to which Mort pops up again at the very end of the episode and whispers, Creepy. Sky God. I almost completely brushed over the episode entitled The Penguin Stays in the Picture because it was misplaced in this season, but in it, crucial things occur. A photographer comes to the zoo and loves Mort's cuteness over privates, and Private wants revenge. He asks some other animals to deal with it, and later thinks he's accidentally had Mort assassinated. So he's full of regret, especially when he starts seeing Mort's ghost everywhere. Only Private sees Mort, probably due to his guilt, or because it's not really Mort. But it has his personality nailed down, and the ghost describes itself as intangible and translucent. He violates Julian's feet as a ghost. Mort starts mocking and teasing Private. He threatens to haunt him. Very evil. Mort's ghost triplicates and starts harassing Private non-stop. He picks up a solid popsicle and tries eating it, so he can be tangible. I just spent a while discussing ghost tangibility and dimensional anomalies in my Spongebob theory on the Flying Dutchman in preparation for this sort of thing, but I'm at a loss for words right now. Nothing can prepare me. This sick entity is always one step ahead. We later learn that Mort was not killed, but kidnapped just temporarily, and that the ghost was a figment of Private's imagination. Ha! I doubt it. Mort is later seen drawing highly abstract art, as well as that fact that he picked up the popsicle as a ghost, and, well, we know how Mort operates. He has a multitude of spirits within his mind, and it's currently my running theory that he's an alien from a parallel universe, and perhaps that this is the said parallel universe, hence the timeline malfunction. Mm -hmm. But all of that recap and presentation will come in the theory segment. I believe the animation style difference is similar to the rationale had in the three-dimensional world behind the wardrobe during Exile, in that it, you know, denotes a variable multiverse. It's possible Mort keeps absorbing and reliving lives in different manners, like this one at the zoo, and it once again supports my theory that the entire Madagascar, or DreamWorks even, canon, is a multiverse of Mort's own imagination. Again, this is something I will try compartmentalizing in the theory videos, but he might be onto something. He's a haunted entity, a poltergeist of infinitely many malicious souls. His goal seems to be to dominate the world and be beloved by all, so he can rule unmatched. He is the star attraction of the Central Park Zoo in this show, being considered a third, nay, fourth, nay, fifth wheel by his peers, but the cutest and most compelling attraction by the humans. It is deeply disturbing that the consistency is maintained in this show, which is not nearly as upfront about being weird and was made before the Netflix show. Ugh, there's so much going on here. He's sacrificial in this show too. He drinks 20 times his own body's volume in water pocket universe. He can hold in urine for days. Mort finds a small basic handheld video game and never puts it down, obsessing more than the feet. Julian wants Mort's attention back, so Kowalski steals the chip from the game, as oddly it is extremely advanced. This devastates Mort, so he gets a cell phone instead. This episode wasn't showing up at first, and I don't know why. I can't miss anything here. He does seem to feel some level of pain, though, too. 
In another episode, he prays to the Sky Gods for forgiveness for doing something he can't remember doing. He asks if it was because he did something to Maurice's oatmeal. Julian compares Mort to a highly trained battalion with a thirst for mindless violence when proclaiming him as his personal bodyguard. Mort responds by saying, I already choked the ukulele hamster. Later, in an event that with flair could be described as a flood of universal truth, it is revealed that Mort only loves Julian for his feet. Devastated, Mort cries at the heavens, screaming, It's true! And Julian, unfazed, says, Well, duh. Spanish Mort surfaces for a split second and reveals intimate knowledge of Mexican tradition. I'm embellishing the hell out of all of this, but you heard it here first, so when you go watching to confirm it, you already have it set in your mind that Mort is an omnicidal misanthrope. It's true, he is, but it's also just a show. Dear God. I'm saying that as if I actually have to remind you of the fundamental nature of this to reel back your perception of my alleged insanity. In the Christmas special, Mort pulls a slobbery kazoo out of his nose, confirming again his pocket universality. The lemurs seem to think that they've been in France this whole time. So could it take place after film 3? It looks here like Mort is stabbed throughout his body with pine needles. I think Mort just might be the most sane out of everyone. If you assume that every ridiculous thing he says is true, then what does this mean? When he's out shopping for a Christmas tree, he finds a twig and says, I know it's small and ugly, but if someone loved it, it could grow to be a beautiful swan, which is the true meaning of Chinese New Year. Something tells me he's subtly referring to himself, and how all he needs is attention so he can manifest his inner Cthulhu. He promptly proceeds to chop down the Rockefeller Christmas tree with a f***ing butter knife. Chaos incarnate. Mort knows how to drive. He has human experience, fragmented, but he's witnessed international history. Is he the evil seated within all humans? Increasingly, there's also really spur-of-the-moment self-referential humor within this show, similarly to the All Hail King Julian variety, but it's much less commonplace. More cautionary tales, though. Julian already knows Santa in this show, proving that this show is at least after, you know, a timeline divergence between the short film Merry Madagascar and the second film. So is Santa a sky god? Are the gods aware of Lord Mortimer the Unchained over here? We still don't know. Julian abuses Mort's lack of a frictional coefficient by using him as endless ice skates. Mort then returns the favor by mistletoeing Julian's feet and producing potatoes out of thin air. Mort also takes the piece of the angel at the top of the tree in the zoo. They're not even hiding his supernatural hyperdimensional transcendence in this show either. Ugh. Mort keeps attracting to the feet in his sleep by swimming to them in mid-air. At this point, he doesn't even hesitate to start walking after falling hundreds of feet. He always lands right side up. It's senseless. He abuses Julian's intermittent depression by taking the feet when Julian couldn't be cared to defend himself. Mort says he wants to be under six feet. Not dead, literally under six different feet. Revolutionary Mort seemingly returns for a brief second. Mort keeps going into people's mouths and knows Taekwondo continuity. Mort is stellar offense. We also see continuity when we witness Mort wearing a blonde wig and a coconut bra, an outfit very similar to the sorts he wears in a show that shall not be named. A new lemur named Clemson, sounds sort of like Crimson, is placed in the zoo and immediately he starts kissing Mort's feet upon assuming Mort is a king. Mort gets deeply unsettled by this. Clemson realizes as Julian is king and soon replaces the job of Mort and Maurice. Mort whispers with a sinister growl, He's evil. Mort seems more aware of omniversal damnation since all hail King Julian, and he can sense the wrongness ever since his internal reawakening. Turns out he's right. I also have to look into Skipper's past sometime. He's been in a variety of wars that his pals have not. Delusion, reincarnation. I absolutely swear to you I make all of these videos on autopilot. I shut off at least half my brain and just exist when typing this all out. I legitimately abuse my own frequent derealization to increase productivity. You're welcome. We see the Sky Gods not fully working outside of Madagascar again. The lemurs engage in superstitious behavior. Julian says, yes, Mort, kick me harder. Mort flattens like a squeaky toy and tries crawling through the ventilation system to see where the air lives. Private goes on a Shakespearean tirade and calls the lemurs little leather jerking crystal button agate ring puke stocking caddis garter Spanish pouches. Private doesn't know what that means and Mort screams that it's true and then says, I think. 
They fire him from a cannon. Mort's tale has a mind of its own, and it's named Rodney. Has he banished one of the souls there? Who knows? The penguins need him to infiltrate a rat colony, so they shave his tail and tell him to be a rat. He suddenly completely acts like one, indicating perhaps he's had the role of other sorts of animals in his lifetime, a multi-faced god. He has a huge red line on the skin of his tail, and he's about to explain it, but Julian cuts him off with jealousy over what he thinks is a birthmark. Later, the rats ask about it, and he gets cut off again. They kidnap Mort when he's discovered, and then he rises the ranks past even the mutated giant rat, and becomes their evil king. Apparently the red mark is sacred and legendary among the rats. Julian loses it and demands he be seen as the original ring tail. Something clicked in Mort after the penguins sent him in and he's been stuck brainwashed as a rat ever since. He accidentally forces the rats to invade the zoo when they otherwise would not have. I believe years ago he absorbed the legendary god of rats into his mind. It comes naturally to him and he screams invasion. Maybe it's revolutionary Mort again. I don't know how he would have absorbed a rat, but remember it's possible he did it to a bear once, and when the feet are used against him, Mort intentionally turns them down, saying, rats don't like feet. Turns out it's just strawberry jelly on his tail. They then take the fake rat nose off of him and he instantly snaps out of it, similarly to the instantaneous personality shifts in All Hail King Julian. This here feels more like the time he was pretending to be a tycoon, though. They ask him to be a penguin, and he does that without hesitation too. He's also joking, though, it would seem. Mort fails to be cute when he actually tries. When Skipper becomes a king for a day, Mort goes after his feet, appreciating their webbing. This implies Mort's fixation with feet lies in their association with royalty, which is crucial, it's a subservience thing. The penguins have a 12th floor maximum security facility beneath their zoo habitat. It's like 12 separate Area 51s to the center of the earth, basically. There are Lovecraft abominations down there, makes sense why they're so intent on hiding it. Are all these zoo animals, famous military commanders, reincarnated knowingly? Makes sense, considering considering their cognitive divergences from birth. Maybe Mort is their eldritch facilitator who's causing this, the hell for his governmental captors. It could be after all, it's his story. Mort calls Skipper crazy. Mort then uses a high-tech subatomic weapon to create a cotton candy hurricane. The penguins have seemingly met the Grim Reaper. Mort fears being punched for once. He hates other cute animals. The penguins say Mort is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Thank God I'm not alone. After being transferred to a horrible petting zoo, he plans to bite all of the children. His bite is OP. He clones and teleports in service of acting as an ergonomically acute cushion. Mort absorbs gases. Hoboken, New Jersey is considered this show's equivalent of hell, and they claim that farts might actually improve its air quality. Boom roasted. Mort gets a sensual moment reminiscent of the other show. The penguins expect Maurice to kill Julian any day now. We meet a sort of fake ghost Alex the Lion, and I'm not sure how much of this confirms the timeline or not. Mort miraculously knows all of the penguins' secret codes and passwords, but not in a consistent way. He's in tune with the collective unconscious of the quantum field. A bizarre scientific phenomenon causes everyone, including Mort, to break into song. He finds it creepy and unnatural, so do I, considering nothing should affect him, for many reasons. In another episode, Mort eats everything in a vending machine, pocket universe tummy. And again, Kowalski's science can overlap hard with this whole magic world we got going on here. And oh my god. God. So anyways, we know Mort is strong, but later King Julian's rear will be smacked unless Mort can throw a mango pit across the zoo. We know he can, but he intentionally flubs it. Ergo, he's into that real fariki sh**. Next up is some vengeful herd mentality commentary, and then Mort survives an exploding missile. One of Mort's teeth is as large as his entire mouth. Julian briefly succumbs to loving Mort. Evil aliens threaten Earth and are destroyed by duplicating jello cubes. This is not new news, considering the tentacle aliens from the other show. There's a season 2 episode named Alienated that involves a pretty freaky plot, but I couldn't find it anywhere. From what I understand, Mort demonstrates a little bit of his power there too, but on to the final season. Mort calls his tail Rodney again. Mort bullies Private. Mort dismisses everyone as unimportant if they aren't within the royal circle. Maybe that's why he's so obsessed. Mort angrily raps about attacking things with coat hangers. A baby Fusa enters the zoo and Mort wants to rip out his eyes. Julian crawls through an elephant's butt and out its mouth? Julian has a nervous breakdown and Mort backs away slowly. Julian calls Rico fat. Obviously, I mean he's a pocket universe. Mort calls the baby Fusa a booty eater. 
Damn. Mort breaks faces and creepily relishes in it. He climbs in the sewer and laughs like the bride of Chucky. Mort blows up on dynamite. He has hella petty cash. The news thinks Mort and Maurice are furry children. Mort plays in a dog's mouth. Kowalski has experience as a high-strung mother. Mort finally has a bizarre romantic all hail King Julian moment with a sock as he walks away romantically and says, don't be a stranger. We're getting closer to the inception of that show, so I'm not entirely surprised. Mort is a walking, talking confirmation bias. The Cavalier iconic humor is also in full effect now, such as when Julian pops by and casually says, hey neighbor, I'm here for a cup of money. There are weird things too, like red herring Morse code sprinkled around a toy store. Mort fears sacrifice when there are real stakes for some reason. Mort and the gang burp to save the world. Long story. More Mort licking. Ladies love him. <sighs> now we're midway through the last chunk and uh, oh, half the season is missing. You see, I paid 90 US dollars to YouTube just to get all these episodes and I didn't even get my money's worth. Just as the show was getting really good too. Nowhere else has these missing episodes either, so now I'm at a severe disadvantage. In addition to Season 2's Alien episode, we're missing Feline Fervor, King Me, The Otter Woman, Action Reaction, Thumb Drive, Private in the Winky Factory, Mental Hen, and Skipper Makes Perfect. Then, we're also missing the entirety of the show's seven episode long reboot finale from Nicktoons containing Operation Swampanzee, Snowmageddon, Tunnel of Love, Operation Lunicorn Apocalypse, The Penguin Who Loved Me, Best Foes, and finally, Night of the Vesuviuses. Comment if I missed any supernatural moments or mort moments that you deem crucial at your own discretion. If I can find the missing 16 episodes, I will speed recap them at the beginning of the next part to this journey the good part, the theories. This is when things will get really creepy, and it's when I will take all of these little comments and ideas I've been throwing about and unify them. I think that whatever happened to Mort in the credits of the Penguins film seriously screwed his mind and the timeline, but how do you fragment the fragmented? That is the question. Things are going to move very fast now, so you'd better subscribe. There's a lot coming in a very short amount of time. Can anyone truly be ready for it? No. The only reason I can do this is because every single time I look in a direction that has crucial information, I don't know what I'm stumbling into. It's literally the equivalent of you viewers screaming, don't open that door, and I swing it wide open anyways, oblivious to the fact that it was Pandora's box and I've been sucked inside, replacing the horrors that were once locked away. I've been preparing for this, I'm interdisciplinary and unemotional. Mort is a fictional character. Anything that comes at me is a monster of my own creation for the entertainment of, let's face it, myself. This is part six of my Madagascar Mort dissertation. Yes, we're finally on to the actual theory segments. Make sure you watch my two hours worth of evidence first. I'll link the playlist now. Watch it. None of this will make sense otherwise. Last time, we dissected the Penguins of Madagascar TV show, but some of the final episodes were missing. By some absolute miracle, the missing episodes spontaneously returned on Amazon Prime. I have a very bad track record with torrenting, so I was real worried for a second there. Now, I will do as promised, and quickly speed recap what is necessary. Go. In Alienated, one of those creepy aliens comes to Earth and uses goop to paralyze Mort, but Mort can still speak, which could or could not be seen as a testament to his power. He later snaps into bloodhound mode to find the feet, which the penguins call a sixth sense. Semi-continuity, he gets hurt as usual, and not much else. I mean, he's flattened with a mace and then electrocuted into hating the feet, but that was all I missed. I swear, if Mort doesn't get his Latin death Diaz ray ass name having smaller than a breadbox primate ass order posing amnesic East African quantum entangled elder god bitch ass off my metaphysical lawn. Hello, I'm the theorizer and I've solved Mort. Ha! <laughs>
<laughs> it took me months of dormant subconscious thought, but I have. He unlocks all of DreamWorks like a skeleton key to every other theory I've ever made. Things are getting more and more complicated, but easier to parse through, so we'll see how long this all ends up being. Time for the analysis. What was our plan again? Oh yeah, Julian feet, 11 ex-wives, anomalous genome. Well, a lot of that was indeed solidified in this series. Most of my thoughts were haphazardly scattered throughout my evidence videos, but here's where we recap and determine what is relevant. This might get rough. So I'm relying on the comments to poke holes or remind me of things. I also didn't note or see every detail in the Penguins of Madagascar, so yes, the comments are there for a reason. Let's do this. The best way to go about explaining everything is simply by discussing Mort's past. We know a little bit about what he is and his past, but plenty can be stably inferred as well. We see him and a female counterpart in the history books of Madagascar, but that was stated as unreliable. What we know for certain is that he has a grandmother and a grandfather who raised him and some other siblings, but I'm not sure how. You see, his timeline loops back in on itself, possibly as a byproduct of his escape from the multiverse. Okay, so I just took it from zero to a hundred. Reel it back. He's claimed his father was a bear, yet he also was his own grandfather, and we get no information on his mother. As you can understand, this is all senseless. If his father was a bear, then his mother must at least be of the Mort species, meaning her parents must be Granny and Grandpa Mort. I'm not sure if this means Mort is his own true maternal grandfather, or if it means Mort fathered a bear. If the latter, then he must have at least been with a bear to produce a bear, right? Can Mort just birth anything? Well, there's another simple explanation that resolves all of these intricate paradoxes and still makes sense. If you've seen my videos, you know his history dates back a lot further than the 50 years he's spent with this family. He's a conqueror of the multiverse. Nearly limitless in power, he can do anything. Now it's time to take it up a few notches. The only answer here is that this is not his family in a usual way sense, or rather, that it is, but only because he willed it. The only way for him to be his own grandfather when it's impossible is if it's in a seriously atypical way. He's existed long beforehand as well, and he's, he's all-powerful, so <laughs> what I mean is simply this. He must have spontaneously generated this entire family and then birthed himself into it as a reincarnation without his memory. Hence, in a way, he is his own grandfather, semi-genetically on both sides. No wonder his granny is so eerily sensual with him. So why? What led him to need this fake family for 50 years? Why and how did he erase his own memory? What is his true history? Because we know it's there. And well, to answer that question, we must look to Smart Mort and Morticus Khan. Smart Mort is interesting because first of all, he knows everything. Most notably, he knows the Heavenly Fruits, the presumed Sky Gods. He is highly acquainted with Mort and has been with him for a very long time, and in essence, he functions as the preservation of Mort's true memory. He is a separate soul in the show, but perhaps he could be the original Mort, like the one who decided to reincarnate himself. There seems to be signs that Mordecus knew Mort from before, such as when he claims he's been waiting eons for him or something, when it had only been like one season since they'd last seen each other. If this is the case, would Smart Mort be the one Mordecus is familiar with? When confronted with Mordecus, Smart Mort dips out immediately. As for our usual Mort, post-rebirth, he sort of acts like a blank slate. He was wiped clean, and with time, has gained his own soul. The personality built from the family that surrounded him, mixed with the subtle echoes of everyone he's absorbed. Smart Mort is the one who remembers. He has the knowledge of humanity, of the universe, of the fringes of reality and beyond. How is any of this power possible? What even is Mort? They say Mort is a species, but that's not true. Mort does not follow the laws of any sort of species, he's just a sort of entity with varying forms, a multi-faced god. Remember when I said he was Kirby? The entire inner world where he keeps his absorbed brethren isn't even inside of his head necessarily, it's just him. Remember all of the evidence for him having a pocket universe inside of himself? That things enter his stomach and they just keep going. My tummy is speaking to me! Told you. Even the films are undeniable. He's a formless entity that looks like a mouse lemur. We've seen inconsistent x-rays, completely abstract genealogy, everything. At some point, maybe to evade suspicion, he took that form. So if Mort's 
are not a species with any sort of consistency, then how the hell does that universe full of morts, the mortverse, even exist? Who are they? There's no female morts there, and yet we saw the female mort in the Adam and Eve. It's like, not a species. And notice something odd. They're not like the other morts. They are all perfect clones of one another. They are not variable here. They are all identical. They all come from the same origin. A similar thing occurs for all morts everywhere else too, but it's... It's all their appearance. All the morts have the same base model. Mouse lemurs have varying shapes and sizes, but every single mort we see in this show is the exact same. Parallel universe variations can sometimes act different, but they all look the same still. The bizarre part, though, is that all of the mortverse morts act identical too, like they originated from a controlled single entity. All morts function as if they came from a single entity, but the mort horde even more so. It's almost like everything originated from a single mort, but then offshoots like Smart Mort and Morticus function as individuals, and when someone like Morticus tries splitting himself deeper, he just gets mindless drones. It's absolutely insane, but it's actually a lot more stable to assume all of these morts just have some origin that is the same, than to try and comprehend the logistics and inconsistencies of Granny Mort and Grandpa Mort not being from a parallel universe, or Morticus having brainwashed thousands of beings of equal intellect. Everything comes from a singularity and is dispersed. Even more realistically, Mort is a character from Madagascar and every other Mort we see is just another Mort character to us. It just so happens to also literally be like that. My point? Morticus could very well not just be some random entity, but could actually be from Mort. When you try and disperse the dispersed, say like splitting Morticus, you would get even more mindless clones, which could be the reason for the Horde's existence. And if Morticus is from Mort, he has history. The eons he referenced, the wars, he is implied to be the reason our Mort was beaten into reincarnated submission. The original Mort being started looking like a mouse lemur, probably to hide from the Sky Gods or from being tethered by the Sky Gods or something like that, and after he did, Morticus and a number of other Morts were fractured off of him. I actually am getting more inclined to say that this was all on purpose, and that the Sky Gods or some other body of forces toppled Mort into a physical, pathetic form. The question is, why would he want to split himself further, and how did he reside in several universes? The answer is that this isn't his fault. The anti-Mort forces split him infinitely across the multiverse, and his journey to absorb his other selves is actually a journey to reabsorb them all. Damn. No species, just an individual split across the multiverse, recollecting himself. A singularity. I'd say the original Mort posed a threat, just his being. It was probably either Smart Mort or Morticus who was the first piece to be chipped away, hence their sheer power. Morticus is taking the reabsorption into his own hands and actively dueling other advanced Morts so he can maintain the title as dominant consciousness and wage war on the Sky Gods. And he was getting close. These gods are the pantheon of supernatural forces that control everything. They appear as fruits to the Madagascar lemurs because it's a form they can comprehend. In actuality, they span the multiverse, maintaining and governing everything. They hang around Madagascar because that's where most of the action is happening. The biggest threat at the time is Mort, who over the course of All Hail King Julian begins to wake up. Smart Mort seems somewhat aligned with the Sky Gods, and they don't appear to feel too threatened at this present time, but they do just keep monitoring. Morticus was clearly the primary threat. Whether it was them who limited Mort to a measly form on Madagascar, or Mort himself who did it, I'm not entirely sure, but it's becoming apparent that he enjoys it. Morticus is the rogue one. Smart Mort is the sane one. Morticus wants Smart Mort, I repeat. Smart Mort vanished the instant he went into Morticus's realm. Mort's seed is planted in every universe. We need to see this original being. The original Mort is the whole Mort. I'm not sure we do ever meet him, really. He is a formless void, extant on all planes of reality. As we've established countless times, his name is Latin for death. And I might even be inclined to say, based on these descriptions, that... <gasps> He has a spine, right? <gasps> 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 he... He is death. He, he's, he's death. He's death. He has a thing for zombies because they are the ones that got away. <gasps> he's... He's death. I can have his body, right? <gasps> he's death. He's death. He's death. He's death. His name is death. For he is Mort the Lemur. He's death. He is not an entirely benevolent death. And what exactly he does after reaping souls? I do not know. But, oh my god. Oh my god, that's it. That's it. 
<laughs> he absorbs souls because he is death. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. In episode one, this has been freaking staring me in the face. In episode one, I said he could reap my consciousness from my body. Oh my god. Oh my god. <sighs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. I just realized that. I was literally even using the same word choices back then, and I didn't even know what I was talking about. He literally is reaping. <sighs> okay, now I'm back into this. Let's go to that wardrobe now. It's a sort of portal to Mort's true self. Not really, but it's like a metaphor for him being in a higher dimension, projecting into our plane whether he created everything or not. Remember, it doesn't matter. Same difference. The scene could be even in his head, of course, but all of that would show is that deep down, he has a direct escape, and it spawns whenever he feels most panicked and alone. We are so many layers into this. Splitting this into three separate theories seems pointless now. His genome? He doesn't have a genome, you fools. He can do anything. What about the feet, then? Is it really a servitude-based obsession? He claims his home is a foot constellation known as Photicus Majora, so does he love feet because they remind him of home, or does he choose to live there because it was shaped like a foot? We did discuss his subservience being the cause before, as opposed to the feet themselves. He's a 14 billion year old elder god who can enter nightmares and has lived the life of every possible kind of person, but the feet. It must have to do with his tethering limitations. No extant being would be weak like this. Perhaps such a small animal is just destined to be at the feet of everyone around him, and the Sky Gods know this. It's why Mordecai said he had to break from the feet. This was before everything. They all split from the same being who has a foot obsession. The trauma from such a blow, losing all of his power, is also his weakness. The feet make him weak as he sings literally, and he's somehow finding peace in servitude, giving his life meaning after an infinite existence of having everything. I need to know more about the Sky Gods or whomever else tethered Mort. He is known by humanity too, you see. The scientists, they want him, they study him, he is a target, he claims they've been unable to classify him, but that's where these grand theories are headed. That's not crucial to where we are right now. Mort has spanned everything. His inner world is an evil mansion. His more abrasive personalities show how vengeful and wrathful he can be in times of war, much to my horror. Todd has similar reactions when placed in attack mode, almost like there's a similar supernatural hypnosis in place to subdue Mort. He steals life so he can rebirth it into himself. He defaults to villainy every time, and many sides of him are appeased when sacrifices are sent his way. He has legions of followers who devour his cuteness, which is exactly what he wants. You are all the goldfish beneath the angler's lamp. You have fallen victim to a true power, one who is not limited by the psychology of personality, and is everything. Fragmentation can't stop this. In short, Mort is an omnipotent Lovecraftian demon that has existed since the beginning of time. His malicious presence was a threat to existence, so he was bound to a limited form and scattered across the multiverse by the gods. Factions of his mind have since begun the process of resorbing themselves, resulting in beings such as Mordecus Khan and whatever our Mort was before his reincarnation. A few thousand years ago, he was destined to face off against Mordecus Khan in a battle for the controlling mind, and as a last-ditch effort to preserve his knowledge, yes, he erased his superficial memory and birthed himself into a family of clones 50 years old. Since then, he has now absorbed Mordecus and the gods are watching, waiting, for the day they'll have to intervene. Mort doesn't seem too agitated at his current position, though. He's learned to find meaning in mundanity. But the gods aren't the only ones keeping tabs. There's that consistent thread through all of these theories that I've only ever hinted to. And surprisingly, we don't need those other two theory videos for Mort. I did it all here. Or at least everything I could recall. It is so insane, but it's still straightforward. And now, the next step for all of you is to watch the theories I've always said will come next. Mort ties into a number of other films, and I have already uploaded these theories. They touch upon areas that he will eventually tie into. They may seem unrelated, but I assure you, they are not. They are all even more sound than this one. So following this video in the playlist, I will have the next several theories. I'll link it in the outro, or click the eye in the top corner again. They're honestly awesome to watch even outside of the necessity they assert for the next phase of Mort theories, wherein we will transition this situation into the ultimate purpose of this dissertation, a purpose that will become abundantly clear after viewing the Shrek and Over the Hedge theories. A DreamWorks timeline. If I missed any other supernatural or relevant factors, comment them below. I might still fill that extra video slot in the event that I forgot major factors at play. If I can be reminded of more important things in the comments below, 
please do it. Also subscribe, of course, hit the bell too. It's important before we move on to this ultimatum. Mort is crazy. Mort is amazing. Everything is his will. His subconscious is multi-dimensional. Everything he desires comes true because he is, because it is in fact forever the case that no matter what it is he's believing, Mort's dream works. I will compound the next phases into their own mega videos soon, and then of course when the whole theory is done there will be the 10 hour video that I've promised, but until that time comes I will link the main playlist with all the individual parts for you to see. In the meantime it's, it's still back in the, the top of the eye corner, whatever the link. Thanks.